everything without predilection. Vegetable matter, linens, woolens, silk, leather. And Pliny does not exaggerate when he says, Fores quoque tectorum, which means even the doors of houses, for they have been known to consume the very varnish of furniture. They reduce everything indiscriminately to shreds, which become manure. Does that uh, give you a picture of the French Revolution? Why they're compared with locusts? Notice in, that Exodus describes the devastating destruction caused by the locusts in Egypt. Uh, you know, this corroborates what we just read from uh, this uh, encyclopedia. For they covered the face of the whole earth, so that the land was what? Darkened. And they ate every herb of the land, and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. So there remained nothing green on the trees or on the plants of the field throughout all the land of Egypt. A fit description of what happened in the French Revolution when Satan and his angels were released to do their work. Now Revelation 9 verse 12 tells us that this cloud of locusts had a king who led them. And what was the name of the king? In Hebrew, Abaddon, and in Greek, Apollyon. Now, normal locusts, according to those who have studied locusts, have no king over them. In fact, the Bible tells us that. Notice Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 27. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 27. That shows that these locusts are not literal locusts. These are, these are weird locusts. Notice uh, Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 27. Chapter 30 and verse 27 says, The locusts have no what? No king, yet they all advance in ranks. <laughs> so they, they're very organized, right? But not because they have a king. So locusts have no king over them. So these must be what? Unusual and supernatural locusts. Now we're going, to, we're going to skip the next two pages. You can read this at your leisure. Let's just read the paragraph at the top of page 172. Some interpreters have seen in this plague of locusts a depiction of the devastations caused by Mohammed and the Muslims in Arabia. However, in his commentary on the book of Revelation, Seiss, Joseph Seiss, who wrote an entire commentary on Revelation, he's not an Adventist, but this is, this is very good, provides a multiplicity of reasons why this interpretation cannot be accurate. So you need to read those two pages to see why uh, this particular trumpet does not apply to Muhammad and the Muslims in Arabia. So let's go to page 174 because time does fly by. The Old Testament uses locusts to describe God's judgments against people who are in rebellion against Him. Was France in rebellion against God? Yeah, yeah. so God sent locusts as a punishment for their rebellion against Him. These locusts make a raging noise like fire. Have you ever heard locusts doing their work? It sounds like the vegetation is burning. That's why you have this, the metaphor of fire here as well. These locusts make a raging noise like fire because they come from the abyss where the fire is. They look like what? like horses ready for battle. So, so these locusts, they're going to come on to France, and what are they going to do? They're going to totally devastate it, spiritually speaking. And they devour like what? Like lions. Have mercy. Who is represented by a scorpion in the Bible? Satan and his angels. We're going to notice that in a few moments. Who is represented as a lion? Not only Satan, but also his angels. We're going to notice that. So, these locusts makes a raging noise like fire. 
and they looked like horses ready for battle, and they devoured like lions. This bizarre symbolism describes the almost absolute destructive power of whom? Of Satan and his angels in France during the French Revolution. These locusts, locusts are clearly what? Symbolic. Because they are a hybrid combination of locust and scorpion. And they don't attack vegetation, they attack people, <laughs> not plants. So obviously these locusts, we're not to look for a certain place where suddenly from the deep come all of these locusts out. No. These are supernatural locusts. They have no king. Furthermore, uh, they're a hybrid combination. They're not only locusts, they have the characteristics of scorpions and lions. So it continues saying here, according, um, and they attack people, not plants. According to Jesus, the scorpion represents whom? Satan. Satan and his angels, I might say. Let's go to Luke chapter 10, verses 18 and 19. Luke chapter 10, verses 18 and 19. See, we allow the Bible to interpret itself, right? Luke, because the Holy Spirit placed in the Bible everything we need to understand the Bible. Luke 10 and verses 18 and 19. This is when the 70 returned to Jesus and they had the power to cast out demons. They say, even the demons obey us. And now notice, it says in verse 17, Then the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And by the way, Ellen White comments that this, de this looks at the whole sweep of Satan's fall from heaven, not only originally, but also at the cross, till the very end of time when he's destroyed. Verse 19, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on what? Serpents and scorpions. And over all the power of the enemy. Who's the enemy? Satan and his angels. Notice scorpions, not scorpion. And nothing shall by any means what? Hurt you. So, the most dangerous part of a scorpion is what? its tail. And what does the tail represent? The tail represents lies. You say, what? Well, let's go first of all to Revelation chapter 12. Isn't it nice to interpret the Bible by using the Bible? Yes. <laughs> you know, it makes study very simple and very easy. Revelation chapter 12, and let's read verse 9. 12 and verse 9. Um, actually, not verse 9. We'll re read verse 9 in a moment. Let's read verse 3. And behold, another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems in his head, on his heads. And what is it that drew a third of the stars of heaven? A third of... Oh, and his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. What do the stars represent here? Verse 9, it says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So what was it that Satan used to take all of the angels with him, or the third of the angels, the ones that he took? His tail. Now what does the tail represent? Well, let's let the Bible interpret itself. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 15. Isaiah 9 and verse 15. It says here, The elder and honorable, he is the head. So, uh, the elder and the honorable, that's the head. Now listen to this carefully. The prophet who teaches lies, he is the tail. So what is the tail that drew a third of the, of the angels of heaven? His lies. Now, in order to understand this more fully, we need to go also to the book of Ezekiel. 
Go with me to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. Did Jesus say that the devil is a liar from the beginning? Yes. John chapter 8. He says there's no truth in him. He's a liar from the beginning. So how did the Satan draw a third of the angels? With his tail, which means with his what? With his lies. That's right. So notice Ezekiel chapter 28. Uh, this is a description of uh, this majestic being, Lucifer, the covering cherub. And we are going to read verses 17 and 18. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze upon you. You defiled your sanctuaries. By the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading, therefore I brought fire from your midst and it devoured you. That word trading is very interesting. The root of the word has to do with a commercial transaction. So what did Lucifer do? He traded. He sold. What did he sell? He sold lies. Have you ever heard the expression, I don't buy that. <laughs> you can't sell me that one. <laughs> So what is Satan selling? Lies. By the way, the same root of this word is used in the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 16. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 16. The same root word is used there. It says there in Leviticus 19, verse 16, God is warning the Israelites, you shall not go about as a talebearer. That's the same root word. So what was Satan selling to the, to the angels in heaven. His lies. His tail draws a third of the angels with his lies. And then it says, Nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. Notice also Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel chapter 22. And uh, we'll read verse third of the angels, which is nearer to half according to the spirit of prophecy from heaven and stole them from the Lord. So, in brief, middle of page 174, this army has all the biblical characteristics that apply to Satan and his angels. Scorpions, serpents, lions, locusts, sulfur, bottomless pit. All of those in Revelation are related to Satan and his angels. Now let's go to, so must there be a special manifestation of satanic power during the fifth trumpet? Absolutely. Now let's notice the comments on Revelation 9 verse 4. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing. Now is this kind of weird? What do locusts eat? They eat vegetation, folks. That's their main course. And then they have the varnish off doors for dessert. <laughs> so anyway uh, you know it says don't harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree but ah but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads so what does the green thing the green grass and the tree represent here it represents those who have the what the seal. those who have the seal are you with me or not in this case, the tree represents the righteous. By the way, are God's people compared to trees? Let's read a couple of statements. Psalm 1, verses 1 to 3, verse of water, that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper in his hand. Are you following me? Like a cedar in Lebanon. So, these locusts, they are not given permission to touch those who are faithful. They are given permission only to afflict whom? Those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Now the question is, how can the fifth seal be speaking about the seal on the forehead, the fifth trumpet speak about the seal on the forehead, if the sealing doesn't take place until the sixth trumpet? Because we're going to see the sealing on the forehead takes place under the sixth trumpet. So 
there appears to be a discrepancy. The question was asked here about that. Well, the fact is that the Bible and the spirit of prophecy tell us that when a person accepts Jesus Christ as Savior, they receive a seal. It's the gospel seal. It's not the end time seal that will seal the 144,000 living saints that will go through the time of trouble. That is a final seal of protection. But there's another seal that people receive when they accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Let's read some verses. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll read verses 13 and 14. We'll let the Bible speak first. Ephesians chapter 1 and verses uh, 13 and 14. Here the Apostle Paul wrote, In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were what? You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So were the Ephesians sealed when they received Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Notice, being that we're in the writings of Paul, chapter 4 and verse 30. Ephesians 4 and verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were what? Sealed for the day of redemption. Notice also uh, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 22. 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 1 and verse 22. Once again, there's a gospel seal. It says there in verse 22, let's read what 21 for the context. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has what? Sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So do believers receive a seal when they accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? Absolutely. That's the seal that is being described here. Those who are true believers in Jesus. Now, Ellen White also measures in. Ellen White, um, in uh, Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 263, referred to a sister Hastings who died in 1850. It wasn't her husband, it was her. She died in 1850. And Ellen White comforted, uh, comforted him, or her rather, uh, by saying in 1850 that, this, uh, that um, Brother Hastings was sealed. So, um, sealed how? Is she alive now? So, uh, is she going to receive the seal of Revelation chapter 7? No. But Ellen White said she was sealed. And that uh, at the resurrection, she would resurrect and be among the saved. So, uh, even Ellen White states that there is a gospel seal and there is an end time seal. Now, she also wrote the following in six manuscript releases, page 28. Those who thus unite with the church by baptism are what? Are sealed as men and women who have been born again of water and of the Spirit. They have entered upon a new life. So we not, need not to confuse the gospel seal with the final eschatological or end time seal. Now let's go to Revelation 9 and verse 5. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. Now here's an interesting detail. Scorpions rarely kill human beings when they sting them. But they do cause excruciating pain by the poison, swelling, suffering, even to the point of peeping, people wanting to die. Applying the year-day principle, the five months would be equivalent to 150 years. Notably, the age of reason, have you ever heard of the age of reason or the enlightenment? Began in the early 17th century with the work of an individual called René Descartes. 
What, what country was Rene Descartes from? France. That's right. Uh, a contemporary of his, Blaise Pascal, wrote the following about uh, Rene Descartes, the rationalist. I cannot forgive Descartes. In all his philosophy, he did his best to dispense with God. Is that atheism? But he could not avoid making him set the world in motion with a flip of his thumb. After that, he had no more use for God or for miracles or for anything supernatural. Descartes' most famous book was called A Discourse on Method, published in 1637, some 150 years before the beginning of the French Revolution. The Age of Reason jettisoned the need for faith and the miraculous in religion. It supplanted faith in God with faith in human wisdom. During this period, the sciences would come to believe that all could be resolved through human ingenuity without the need of an ever-interfering God. Notably, these philosophies would not kill people, but they would make them what? Existentially miserable. The age of reason inspired the French Revolution. Now let's go to the next verse, which is connected with the concept of verse 5. In those days men will seek what? Death. Death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. Is that what happens with a person who doesn't believe in God, someone who has no hope for the future, no reason to live? Absolutely. Notice this statement from Ellen White that I read before. I think I read it this morning. Atheism can shed no ray of light into where? Grave. Into the grave. It cannot restrain crime or quicken the moral energies. It has no power to elevate the character or purify the soul. On the contrary, it always tends to degenerate the human race. Is that what happened in France? Yes. It leads away from purity and peace. An instance of this is given in the history of the French Revolution. Now she's going to apply this to the French Revolution. That period when the existence of God was denied and His commandments were abol abolished was the most revolting that is recorded on the pages of human history. The main characteristic of contemporary society is meaninglessness. Do you know that suicide has greatly increased yes. in recent years? Yes. Why? Because life has no meaning for people. This is why people are hungering and thirsting for what? For spirituality. But they're looking for it in the wrong places. That's right. They're, working, they're looking for a reason to live. The rise of philosophies such as deism, ethical relativism, nihilism, rationalism, existentialism, evolutionism, and atheistic communism has led people to be pessimistic about the meaning of life. After all, if there is no supernatural divine beginning, what hope is there for a supernatural divine end? If there is no creator God, there is no future. And if there is no future, then life has no ultimate meaning. This is the reason why the psalmist says that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Are you catching the picture? People wanting to die. The scorpions sting. They cause excruciating pain and suffering, spiritually speaking. Now notice this statement from uh, Ellen White. Uh, to, to, uh, I think this TDG is uh, Today with God. 339. There are many ways in which human beings can crucify the Son of God afresh and put Him to open shame. The worship of worldly business so confuses the mind that Satan stealthily approaches and insidiously gains entrance. He has many theories away. The book of Ecclesiastes is a good illustration of the spirit that inspired the French Revolution. 
Have you ever read Ecclesiastes? Do you know that that's one of the last books that the Jews included in the canon of Scripture? There were three books that were included last by the Jews in the, in, in the Old Testament. One was Song of Solomon. It was two, um, how would I say, uh, too graphic <laughs> in referring to sensual love. The second book, which uh, took a long time to include, was Esther, because the name of God is not mentioned. And the third book is Ecclesiastes, because this appears to be an extremely pessimistic book. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. You know, you read the book, it's depressing. The question is, why is this book included in Scripture? Because Solomon is describing his life when he went astray from God. The important thing is not the pessimism of a book, but how he ends the book. <laughs> the end of the matter is this. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man, for God will bring every work into judgment. And then he counseled the youth. He says, remember thou thy creator in the days of their youth. Before the evil days come and you look back and you say, I have no joy in them. He's describing his life separated from God. And do you know that Solomon, Ellen White even said that he toyed with the idea of atheism, of becoming an atheist? Notice what we find at the top of page 177. Ecclesiastes 2, 17 and 18, and I'm reading from uh, the New International Version, which I think is more vivid. Solomon says, so I hated what? Did he want to die? <laughs> yes. Was he suffering? You better. In fact, Ellen White said that he became effeminate. What does effeminate mean? He, be, he became woman-like. Now, that's not a bad thing, unless you're a man. <laughs> it's good for women to be effeminate. It's not good for men. So he says, So I hated life, because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All, all of it is what? meaninglessness and chasing after the wind. Have you ever tried to grab the wind? And then in verse 18 he says, I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. That is the life of the atheist. The life of the person who has gone astray from God. That is the spirit of, of this French revolution. Ellen White wrote in Prophets and Kings, page 58, about Solomon, his faith in the living God was supplanted by atheistic doubts. Unbelief marred his what? His happiness. Weakened his principles and degraded his life. Does that sound like what happened to the people who were participated in the French Revolution? Absolutely. A good illustration of this is Ernest Hemingway, who spent a good share of his life in Cuba. A miserable man, drunk a good share of the time. Nobel Prize winner for literature in the year 1954 because of the book that he wrote, The Old Man and the Sea. It's a depressing story. Man, you read that, it's depressing. You know, this fisherman has gone out, you know, he's old, he's over the hill, and he's gone out fishing, and he can't catch anything anymore. And so his friends are making fun of him. And so one day he goes out, and he catches this huge marlin. And wow, he says, now I'm going to take it back to the shore, and I'm going to show that uh, life still has meaning. And so when he's on his way back, the sharks attack, because he's put, he's put this huge fish such as nobody has ever seen before next to his boat and the sharks attack. To make a long story short, by the time that uh, he gets to the shore, all he has to show is a skeleton. 
That is a symbolic depiction of his life. Do you know how Ernest Hemingway died? In 1961 he took out a revolver and shot himself in the head. By the way, do you know that Ernest Hemingway was a great student of the book of Ecclesiastes? He wrote a work which has not been published. The title of the work is The Sun Also Rises, which is a phrase that appears in the book of Ecclesiastes. He was fascinated by Ecclesiastes because he could see in it a reflection of his own life. And at the end, life had no meaning, so he committed suicide. Are you with me? That's the spirit of the French Revolution. That's what the world is reaping today. Now let's read the statements here in the middle of page 177. Have you ever heard of Hume the philosopher? It is said that Hume, the skeptic, was in early life a conscientious believer in the Word of God. Being connected with the debating society, he was appointed to present the arguments in favor of infidelity. Be very careful about defending what you don't believe in. He studied with earnestness and perseverance, and his keen and active mind became imbued with the sophistry of skepticism. Ere long, he came to believe its delusive teachings, and his whole afterlife bore the dark impress of infidelity. Voltaire, one of the key figures in the French Revolution, we're told when Voltaire was five years old, he committed to memory an infidel poem. Infidel means faithless. And the pernicious influence was never effaced from his mind. He became one of Satan's most successful agents to lead men away from God. Thousands will rise in the judgment and charge the ruin of their souls upon the infidel Voltaire. Rationalism even came to the point of denying the story of creation. You can read the, the next uh, statement that begins at the bottom of page 177 and ends at the top of page 178 because we need to finish this particular chapter. Let's notice the comments on Revelation chapter 9 and verse 7. The shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. Where is the backdrop to this in the Bible? The backdrop of this imagery is in Joel chapter 2 and verses 4 through 10, where God compares an invading army with a plague of locusts. It is of interest, this is an interesting thing, that the Italian word for locust is cavaletta. What does cavaletta mean in Italian? Little horse. <laughs> Interesting. The, the locust is related to the horse. In fact, it, uh, in some ways it looks a little bit like a horse. And the German peasants call the locust hupfarda, which means hay horses. At this point, Satan and his angels are already gathering their forces for what? For the final battle against, the God, against God, the Bible, and His people. Their hair was like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron. The sound of their wings, their flying, was like the thundering of what? Of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. Were they, were they ready to go to France and do their work? Yes. They had tails and stings like scorpions, and in their tails they had what? power to torment people for five months. So let me ask you, are their lies a torment to people? The doctrines of the French Revolution, absolutely. Now what does a lion represent? It says here that they had lion's teeth. What does a lion represent in the Bible? Well, it can represent Christ, it can represent Babylon, it can represent Judah, the, the son of Jacob, but it can also represent whom? Satan, who goes forth as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. But his angels also are compared with lions. 
Notice the statement from early writings, page 191. Satan, this is after Jesus gained the victory over Satan, ascended to heaven, Satan relabeled by the lie of what? False religion. But during the age of reason, Satan deceived and hurt people by the lies of what? Secularism or atheism. And here comes the interesting part. You know, let me ask you, who are going to be the greatest enemies of God's people, the liberals or the conservatives? <laughs> well, it all depends whether you support Joe Biden or Donald Trump. <laughs> no, actually, who were the liberals in Christ's day? The liberals were the Sadducees. Who were the staunch conservatives? The Pharisees. They hated each other. And they had different doctrines. But when it came to destroying public enemy number one, they joined forces. So let's not get politically involved and say, you know, they, oh, we need to side with the conservatives or we need to side with the liberals. You know, because the Bible tells us that the king of the south and the king of the north will join forces to persecute God's people. Final comment, Revelation 9 verse 11. The king who rules over the locusts is the angel of the abyss. Who, who is identified in the Bible with the abyss? Satan. In Revelation chapter 20, right? He's put in the abyss or the bottomless pit as it's mistranslated. So the king who rules over the locusts, over this army that is going to unleash on France in the fifth trumpet, his name is in Hebrew, Abaddon, and in Greek, the equivalent Greek word is Apollyon. The names Abaddon and Apollyon means what? Destroyer. The destroyer. Is that exactly what happened in the French Revolution? Yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. The New Testament describes Satan except to steal and to kill and to what? And to destroy. But Jesus came what? I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Tomorrow we will study the interlude of Revelation 11. And then, maybe tomorrow, we'll study Revelation 10, which is also part of the interlude. In verse 12, those who follow Christ will be commandment keepers, and the Sabbath is a commandment of God. Remember, study to show thyself approved. Welcome to The Heart of Health Live. 
There's a place for modern medicine in your life. Learn to use it correctly by getting your toughest questions answered on today's broadcast. Discover modern medicine's strengths and weaknesses. Lifestyle medicine opens the door to optimum health and healing. How you live and what you eat can profoundly affect mind and body. Learn simple solutions to complex problems. God provides the ultimate healing we all desire. He wants us healthy and happy. We just need to understand His plan for our lives and live accordingly. And now, live from Studio 1A in Chattanooga, Tennessee, here's your Heart of Health host, Dr. James Markham. Good evening, and thank you for joining us here on the Heart of Health Live. Uh, actually, Dr. Markham is going to be our guest on the program this evening, but I'm Nick Evanson, and I'll be happy to sit in for him and host the program. Um, we're going to answer your questions tonight. We're going to take questions from the website, and uh, we want you to engage with us in any way possible. And uh, sometimes we have you call in, uh, but in tonight, I'd like to encourage you to go to our website at heartwiseministries.org, and there's a lot of good resources there. First, you can watch this program. Uh, right on, on the front page, you can watch it. And uh, last week we had a dentist on, the week before that. We have a lot of different topics. So you can watch this program and catch up on all the latest episodes of the Heart of Health Live. And we also have a, a page there called Ask the Doctor. And that's your opportunity to go in there. It's completely private. And you can say whatever you need to say and ask your questions and get some free health advice. So that's Ask the Doctor at heartwiseministries.org. We also want you to write in and give us your best recommendations for healthy restaurants. Uh, we believe that if people know where healthy options are, that those can be great alternatives when people are eating out, when they're traveling, and that kind of thing. So go to our Healthy Eats section and submit a restaurant review. Um, we also believe in the power of prayer. Every week before the program, Dr. Markham and I and uh, the other staff, we get together and we go through our prayer form on the webpage, and we pray for each person who uh, gets on there and, and lists their prayer requests. And we believe that God heals in a, in a variety of different ways, and uh, we just want to lift everyone up in prayer. And uh, we hope that you will join us and do that as well. And uh, Dr. Markham, what are some other ways that people can engage with HeartWise? Yeah, uh, you know, the big thing, Nick, is this is a ministry that everyone can be a part of. And you've mm -hmm. already mentioned the prayer and the restaurants. And well, one thing they can do is tell their friends about, you know, if you have That's a health right. problem, you want to get some information, they can be a Facebook friend. That's right. You know, and when we give them the information, they can also go to the website where they might learn something more about developing this relationship. That's right. You can find us on Facebook or also on Twitter. So. Get in touch with us, engage with us, and ask us your questions. We're going to be back in just a moment for more Heart of Health Live with Dr. Markham. Stay tuned. The Heart of Health Live will return in just a moment. The Heart of Health Live is brought to you by HeartWise Ministries. This year, it's estimated that 56 million people will die. Some from old age, some from disease, and still others from terrible tragedies. At HeartWise, we can't do anything about sudden death, but what we can give you is free medical information that will help you live a longer, more fulfilling life with less disease and illness. If you are interested, we would love to talk to you about our wonderful God whom we love and serve, who is with us even when we are going through heartache. If you have a medical question, or if you are just at the end of your rope, call us at 855-644-3278. At HeartWise, we believe in truth, love, and healing. Your life online doesn't change who you are, or does it? At heartwiseministries.org, you'll find the tools and encouragement that just might change your life. You can submit health questions and receive free advice from practicing physicians. Listen to HeartWise radio shows and watch our television programs, which are designed to help you make smarter choices about your health. And when you feel discouraged, request prayer in our prayer form and join us in praying for others. Because it's not only what you know about your health that matters, it's who you know. Hello, I'm Dr. James Markham. What is the number one health risk for our youth today? Well, believe it or not, it's texting and talking on the cell phone while driving. In 2011, 23% of accidents involved texting. That represents over 3,000 killed and 416 wounded. That's a lot of young people. 
That's the equivalent, if you're texting and driving, to drinking four beers, and it increases your crash risk 23 times. And the average person takes their eyes off the road for five seconds. If you think about reaction time, that affects about 100 yards if you're going 55 miles per hour. Do I have a pill to prevent this texting? Well, I wish. But let's make a pledge today, each one of us, on the road, off the phone. To learn more, visit our website, heartwiseministries.org. You've got questions, we've got answers on the Heart of Health Live. Welcome back. Welcome back. I'm your host, Nick Evanson, here with Dr. Markham. And uh, we are going to talk to you for just a moment about some of the projects that we work on here at HeartWise. And uh, we just want to introduce you. Maybe you're a new viewer, and we want to introduce you to everything that we do here at HeartWise. And Dr. Markham, welcome to the program. Well, thanks, Nick. And we have been very active here at HeartWise. And a lot of people have been calling in, asking about our programs, our television programs. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a lot of exciting new partnerships we've entered into. We've got some new programs, one that we're partnering with, um, Plant Pure Nation. In fact, we have a documentary coming out within the next few weeks with Plant Pure Nation, um, and it talks about the importance of eating healthy. And right. it's going to be a theatrical debut. That means it's going to go in theaters first. Mm -hmm. Probably won't stay long in theaters, and then it will go into um, Netflix and DVDs and sure. that. And this is a great way to get someone interested in health for the first time, importance of diet. But one of the programs that we're also um, going to be participating heart-wise is that they've asked us to help us in a weight loss plan. Right. And yeah. we call that a jumpstart program. Mm -hmm. And this is a wonderful program where if a person really wants to try to lose weight, which many people need to, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. they have a plan. And you can each one of you that's interested can be part of it. We'll tell you how to do that. But um, they would, um, for 10 days, we would give them a plan. They have a video that they watch, some right. meal plans. We would measure their blood before 10 days and after and see the dramatic improvement. Mm -hmm. And it would introduce them to healthy eating. In fact, eating a healthy diet, a plant pure diet, is right. one of the best ways and long standing ways to lose weight. Yeah. So we mm -hmm. hope a lot of people will give it a try. And when they see the numbers, they say, wow, my cholesterol went down, my blood sugar went down. That will encourage them to continue on eating this way. So that's right. one program. And actually, I'm going to get to go out next week um, to Hollywood. They're releasing it on Rodeo Drive next Thursday. Mm. And we're going to be part of that. And I'm just glad. And I'm hoping that through this interaction that we can plant some more seeds as people are interested right. in health, letting them know that, you know, where did our health come from? Right. Our ultimate physician. Mm -hmm. And drop some more seeds in a whole new environment. Yeah, you know, it's really exciting that you get to go out to the premiere uh, next week. Um, you know, that's something that I can kind of uh, attest to. I've been a vegetarian all my life and, you know, primarily ate vegetarian food, but that doesn't necessarily mean plant pure food. Right. And uh, recently I've been doing some training in my own uh, exercise and that kind of thing, trying to lose a little bit of weight and eat healthier. Mm -hmm. And I've found that, you know, vegetarian food is not the same as plant pure. Right. And it's, it's different, you know, and I, you know, we tell people, you know, sometimes vegetarians aren't healthy. Sometimes right. vegans aren't healthy, right. but a whole food plant-based diet lets people primarily eat fresh fruits, vegetables, nuts, and grains first. Mm -hmm. You know, make that the centerpiece of, of their diet. Right. Try to stay away from a lot of processed foods. You know, of course, vegetarians, sometimes they eat some cheese and, you know, things in cans. And, and sometimes, you know, vegans eat too much sugar. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so this is a, a real balanced program. And all those are good ways to eat. But this might be a way that will appeal to even a broader group of people. Right. Now, several years ago, there was a documentary called Forks Over Knives. Yes. And I know a lot of folks may have seen that at their church or uh, different venues. Um, and this film is by some of the same people, yes, is that right? Yes, John Corey and Lee Fulkerson, um, th th they were involved in the first film, and they're also involved in this film, as right. well as Nelson Campbell, who is T. Colin Campbell's son, who's probably the foremost nutritionist in the world, mm -hmm. and he's going to be talking and sharing his views. But the whole premise of the movie is it's, you know, we know why this is important, and many people out there know that what they eat is important. The question is, why don't we do it? Right. Why don't we do it? And those reasons are going to be out there because if we understand why, maybe we can work around that and give people some solutions to eat healthy. So that's one of the big projects that HeartWise is involved in this next, next week or two. Yeah. You know, um, I think Forks Over Knives, they did 
release it theatrically, and then mm -hmm. it was available on DVD for churches and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Uh, do you know the the film is released in July? I, I, is it going to be available later for yes, church I, groups and that well, kind of right thing? Right now, church groups can get a hold of it, you know, for the fall because we've had one right. church group that already asked us right. if we get. So it is going to be available um, at least in the fall. I don't know how easy it is, but you know, we can help sure. people get that if they want it. And then, what's what's the reason you're involved in this yes. project? What's is it? Is this project just about making money, or what is the purpose for this project? Well, Plant Pure Nation. A, a couple things. Is one is it's not only to help people eat healthier, but it's also to protect the earth. You know, mm. and the ec economy of the earth to be a good steward of the things we've got. Right. And long term, they're hoping for this project to develop food that will feed people that don't have food. Right. Yeah. That's what they're really doing. They're hoping to feed those without food. They're hoping to be the arms and feet of God to help people and not only feed them, but feed them in a healthy way. So they right. developed a food line with this that they can get plant pure food that they can order. And they're working on the pricing right now, but it's gonna be about $6.50 a meal for a really good, and if, if anyone's gone out lately, you know, you can spend that on bad food yeah, pretty quick. Easily, easily. So there's gonna have that in order, and so that's gonna be an ongoing program, and they're gonna work with us with that, and some of the proceeds are even gonna help support 501c3s like Heartwise and sure. others that can also get it. And it's our goal that as people learn more, they'll wanna know a little bit more about health, mm -hmm. they'll stumble onto our website and learn that it's about that relationship that we have with the ultimate physician that right. leads to ultimate healing. And this is a new group of people that we can spread the gospel to. Yeah, it sounds like a great project, and it's not just about making money, but about sharing truth. Um, whether or not they even know that it's biblical, it's right. really leading people back to the original diet that we were designed to live on. That's right, so that's one of the big projects Excellent. we're working on. What, what about, uh, what are some other projects? I know we've been talking about yeah. biblical prescriptions for yeah. life a lot recently. What, what is that program? Well, that program is we're really kicking that off, and I want to tell everyone about that because your church or group might be interested in And it's a three-part seminar mm -hmm. with a question and answer series. We're not only filming it, but we're going out in person, and we're already arranging visits right. around the country with that. And as you've been involved with it, what we do is we let people know why they're sick, give them specific things they can do right now to change their chemistry and introduce people to the relationship that they might have with their creator. Right. And that leads to healing. We do it all in a scientific-based manner, give them mm -hmm. evidence-based, and then it's based on building a relationship. And we're hoping that churches and groups will invite people that are interested in being off of medicine or preventing a heart attack or being more healthy or right. making some changes in their life. They'll bring those people to this meeting and we've asked the groups that do it if they will bring that group back to have a follow-up. One group that we did it is having a supper club. Yeah. And right. we're also in the process of developing a Bible study that should be done next year, early next year, that we can leave with people and that they can use that as a study guide to continue to grow that relationship with new people that they bring into their, their family. And we're hoping that will spurn more questions. You know, in Luke, Christ first met people's needs. Right. He healed them. He tried mm -hmm. to help them. And from there, he introduced them to the Father, and he let the Holy Spirit do the transforming. Right. Well, that's sort of the plans of biblical prescription for life. It's another avenue, another way to, to share the gospel with people. There's lots of great ways out there, Nick. That's right. You know, some people are doing it with, with, with seminars and revelation seminars. Some people are doing it with, with financial peace. Well, this mm -hmm. is just a way that they can do it with health, and that might reach a group that some of these other that's right. rates are not listening. So yeah. that's a big project with us, and we're also um, partnering with some other people, Moody Radio. We're going to work on some one-minute health spots. We just signed a contract, This World, with Trans World Radio mm -hmm. to put our radio and TV programs on, and this program will be running with them soon. Right. Um, in National Leaders Broadcasting has informed us this week that they're going to take Heart of Health Live overseas. Right. So that's another network that's carrying overseas. 3A Angels Broadcast carries overseas, and also MetaBiz carries overseas. So, so God is planting seeds, and you and the audience can be involved in prayer, sharing this with your friends, helping us on the social media, because this is really everyone working together to spread the gospel. Yeah, you know, there's really a lot of things going on here at HeartWise, and we are so grateful. Um, thank you so much to all of our viewers who support us, and uh, stay tuned. We've got more program. We're going to go to some questions that came in from the website in just a moment, so stay around. There's more to come. The Heart of Health Live will return in just a moment.
Heartwise Ministries. And these adorable sheep. <laughs> Want to remind you that every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern, the Heart of Health Live is all new with an exciting guest. That's 6 p.m. right here on this station. Hi, I'm Dr. James Markham. I want to give you three things today that will help improve your health and change the chemistry of the entire body. The first is drink water. Did you know that 70% of Americans don't drink enough water every day? Sounds easy, so why don't you drink some water? The second is make sure you get enough rest, both a weekly rest as well as a nightly rest. Make sure you break your routine once a week. Maybe turn off the TV or the computer one hour earlier every night. The third thing I would suggest is get up and move. Even if you can't get in an exercise program, which I recommend, at least get out of the chair and move around the room every hour. If you'll do these three things, this will change the chemistry of the entire body. Remember, a pill just changes one chemical pathway. To learn more, I want you to go to our website. That's heartwiseministries.org. Time. Time to call 911 immediately. The sooner they get to the hospital, the sooner they'll get treatment. And that can make a remarkable difference in their recovery. Learn the body language, the sudden signs, and spot a stroke fast. You've got questions. We've got answers on the Heart of Health Live. Welcome back. Welcome back, and thank you so much for watching the Heart of Health Live. I'm Nick Evanson, your host, here with Dr. Markham. And Dr. Markham, we've had some questions yeah. come into our website, and uh, that's heartwiseministries.org. And if you have a question, you can go there on the homepage and click Ask the Doctor, and you can submit your question right there. It's secure, it's free, and uh, Dr. Markham and our other guests who have been on the program will help give you some free health advice. So uh, our first question comes in, and uh, it's about the new guidelines for cholesterol from the government. Uh, what are these guidelines, and what's it all about? Yeah, well, they haven't formally been released, but we've got some, some recommendations that it's going to say that the total cholesterol content in food, we shouldn't make such a big deal about, Nick. Mm -hmm. And what they're saying is, you know, the total cholesterol level that we eat in food, the cholesterol that's in the food, doesn't necessarily correlate with our blood cholesterol. And why this is such a big issue is for, for decades now, we've been talking about cholesterol. Um, cholesterol blocking arteries up, you know, mm -hmm. causing heart disease, which is the number one killer in the entire world. Right. In fact, 40% of all Americans, 4 in 10, have some type of cardiovascular disease. That's really significant. Yeah. That's a and, big number. And some people have it, and they don't even know it. Right. Well, for years, they tried to paint a magic bullet. Mm -hmm. that it's all cholesterol, all cholesterol. So they developed billion-dollar industries in treating cholesterol. Okay, and they really focused on food. You can't eat foods high in cholesterol. Well, now they're realizing that this disease is more complex than just cholesterol. And right. now they're saying, well, the, the, the actual cholesterol content in food doesn't correlate with your blood cholesterol measure. So when people hear these guidelines, now these guidelines from nutrition have been flawed for years. Yeah. They have been flawed for years. Um, in fact, you know, nutrition as a science has grown so much. You know, years ago, we thought, you know, the food groups, you know, what were you growing up with, you know? Right, we right. We thought these food groups, the best foods to eat were, were eggs and cheese and meat. We thought that for years. Right. And now the science has said, no, you know, even on the food groups, I used to have cakes and cookies on the food right. group pyramid. I remember seeing a clip that said something about milk, the nearly perfect food, yes. you know? <laughs> yes. So, so nutrition science has changed. Yeah. Okay? Right. But these guidelines are a little bit misleading because they say they make you feel like you can eat food that you used to, you used to not eat that had cholesterol. So it makes it sound like yes. cholesterol doesn't matter, you yeah. can have it all. Right. But in, in essence, the truth of the matter is this, is that those that really understand nutrition realize that the foods with the most cholesterol in them, even though the cholesterol is not as big deal as they're emphasizing, the foods themselves 
trigger the production of cholesterol. In fact, in fact, you know, animal protein. You know, the body is made to have about, from my study, about 10% of your calories in protein. Well, unfortunately, the standard American diet, the SAD diet, okay, yeah, yeah. is right. comes on people eating 20 to 30% protein. Well, any proteins are enzymes in our body. They change chemical reactions. So when we exceed that limit, mm -hmm. bad things happen in the body. Um, one of the things that happens is you develop a, 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 a process called acidosis, a metabolic acidosis. You've got a lot of negative charge in the body. Right. Well, when that happens in all the cells, the body tries to buffer it. You know, okay. you've seen that in chemistry. Mm -hmm. You know, you try mm -hmm. to buffer it. And it bufferates by pulling positive charges from places, like calcium from the bone. Right. You know, magnesium, mm -hmm. things that so it tries mm -hmm. to even things out. Well, that process goes on all through the body, causes a lot of grief. That is not good. Well, that happens on high-protein diets. Okay. Another thing that happens is it, it turns on a bunch of chemicals in, you know, like, um, um, insulin-like growth factor one and two, mm -hmm. some genes that actually trigger cholesterol to be made in the liver. Oh, okay. And that is the real problem with this recommendation, is people, foods with cholesterol in it, like animal products has high in cholesterol, um, those proteins trigger, high proteins trigger the production of cholesterol in the body. Right. So it's those foods that actually trigger more of the cholesterol production than the actual cholesterol in them. So maybe alongside with these new guidelines, maybe there should be a little amendment to it that says here's a list of food that are going to increase your production of cholesterol yeah. so maybe you should stay away from these and it's probably not going to be done because right. that's not a big money maker that's right you know, right yeah. now one in five dollars is spent on health care that predominantly treats symptoms and not causes mm -hmm. but not only you know for those who want to learn more about protein these high protein diets above 10 percent for long periods of time it causes the body to make more estrogen mm -hmm. okay um, and estrogen, of course, you know, is a fuel for cancers, right. increase, you know, breast cancer. Mm -hmm. um, it also turns off in males testosterone. Mm -hmm. That's not good either. Um, it does a lot of other things in the body. It turn, all this extra protein tends to regulate certain genetics in our body that promotes aging, changes right. our telomeres. So having too much protein turns on a lot of things in our body that God didn't make us to turn on. And right. this triggers disease to happen. And guess what? If you get disease, guess what you need? A stent, a right. bypass, a cholesterol-lowering pill. Medications. Where you could yeah. probably treat your problems much better by getting at the root cause. Yeah. And that's why these guidelines are a little bit misleading. Um, they make it, almost make it seem like, oh, yeah, I can eat these foods now because there's not much cholesterol in them. And we right. know the foods that are high in cholesterol like eggs. Um, dairy products like cheese, mm -hmm. meat, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. but, but it's really, you know, even though there's not too much cholesterol per se in them, it, the substances that they come in trigger the production of the cholesterol, cholesterol and have right. high protein, which changes more than cholesterol. It changes all these other pathways in the body. It, it actually even affects the way you think, Nick, mm. you know, because yeah. acidosis, when you're in an acidic environment, you turn down production of vitamin D. Vitamin D turns on serotonin, which helps your, your moods. So we're finding out that nutrition, the inputs in our body are much more complicated than we could have ever imagined. Now, that's just the food inputs. Can you right. imagine the brain inputs right. that we're going to, you know, how can it be healthy? I was reading, I don't know if you read about that, but recently in the news, there was um, a guy that won the Olympics. He mm -hmm. won the Olympics, mm -hmm. yep. and he decided to turn himself into a woman. And now he's getting awards for that. I mean, but, but, but the media is shaping the way we think, right. and, the yeah. shaping the, and that can't be good for us. And that yeah, triggers uh -huh. stress and inflammation in the brain, which also causes chemical reactions right. that we cannot really understand. Right. You know, back to the cholesterol and the protein, yeah. So if I eat dairy, meat, these type of products, it's going to trigger my liver to produce more cholesterol. Mm -hmm. So because of the extra protein, that triggers the liver, right? Right. So what happens from, we talked about plant sources of protein. What about, or sorry, animal sources. Yeah. What about plant pro like protein? Don't seem to do that. So okay. legumes and beans, all these great sources of plant protein, doesn't Do trigger? Doesn't seem to do that. So okay. we want them to go for more of a plant proteins and, but we do want to keep the overall level, if they can, down. You know, we sure. won't want it to go, you know, 15% would be the high end. Mm -hmm. um, even of the good proteins, we want to keep that balance like mm -hmm. most foods are. 
you mm -hmm. know, and you want to keep the fats, you know, around 10% and eat lots of um, what we call the healthy carbohydrates that right. comes in fruits and vegetables. Right, right. So a lot more greens would do yes. everybody a fair bit of good and then staying away from meat and dairy yeah. and those type of and products. I, I, greens are one of, you know, probably one of the best foods for the heart is greens. It triggers mm -hmm. a chemical called nitric oxide, which makes the, the arteries bigger. And one of the worst foods for the heart is cheese. Lots of fat, fat paralyzes nitric oxide, so the arteries can't get bigger. So I know you exercise a lot. Mm -hmm. If you ate a lot of cheese before you exercise, the arteries can't get big enough to bring it, it was good to blood and oxygen to your muscles. Right, right. Not good. So that's the big debate. And so you can't believe everything you see or read in the media. Um, the media is shaping the way we think. It's putting stress on people. It's glorified people for doing mm -hmm. things that really, to me, sound a little bit crazy, Nick. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know. It these, definitely leads us away from yeah. God's original and design. Then, and then it glorifies it, you yeah. know. Doing right. this, and I heard that this fellow that did that is actually winning an award for it. Yeah. It's strange times that we live in. It is. But we get back to the original plan. It's the safest thing. That's right. Hey, thanks for being a part of our discussion. If you want to call in, our number is 855-644-3278. Uh, you can call in and give us your questions, and we'll be back in just a moment. Stay tuned. The Heart of Health Live will return in just a moment. Hi, my name is Jake, and I would like you to think about the importance of exercise. Did you know that exercise helps you to think better, look better, sleep better, and even play better. Exercise can help you avoid heart problems down the road, and I think it just makes me feel better. Personally, I enjoy swimming, but did you know that any type of movement counts? Playing outside, especially running and jumping, that counts as exercise also. Just getting up from sitting every hour and walking around the room can help. Some people even wear a fancy device to help count their steps called a pedometer. Exercising today will help make the future healthier and happier. So, now that you know the importance of movement, I challenge you to make sure you are moving every day. I'm Jake, and this has been today's healthy tip to stay fit. What's your healthiest meal? What? What's, do you have any health meals, anything that's fresh? No, we don't. The culture in America is that everything revolves around food and unhealthy food. The health care cost trajectory is out of control because the consumers are not in charge. This is clearly an unsustainable trend. We're not telling people how to use food. Red meat, Beef. green beans with bacon and butter. When we talk about this idea of plant-based nutrition. It's a powerful concept, and it's one that my father is associated with. Dr. Colin Campbell, doc. Whole foods, plants-based diet. Right. You don't mean the store. No. <laughs> I went on essentially a plant-based diet. No dairy, no meat. Type 2 diabetes, heart disease, hypertension. <laughs> Gone. Medicines That Kill from cardiologist Dr. James Markham is now available. In his newest book, Dr. Markham explains why he believes that medications may very well be the number one cause of death in America. Medicines That Kill uncovers the hidden risks associated with modern pharmaceuticals and outlines the biblical plan for physical and spiritual health. To find out how to get your copy, visit our website at heartwiseministries.org or call us toll free at 855-644-3278. got questions we've got answers on the heart of health live welcome back welcome back i'm your host nick evanson and thank you so much for watching the program tonight uh dr mark and we've had a number of questions coming to the website and people have been calling in here in the last uh few minutes giving their questions and uh, if you want to call in if you have a question the number is 855-644-3278 and uh kelly's in the call room she's going to take your call and uh we'll we'll get as many of, of them out here as we can but our first question from the website, Dr. Markham, is on migraines. What yeah. are some treatments, maybe what are some common treatments, and then what are maybe some of the best treatments that you think are yeah. out there for migraines? Migraines are a very complicated issue in the brain, and, it, and a lot of, of us think it has to do with the blood vessels in the brain. Mm -hmm. And my feeling is what happens is there's triggers in our life that triggers the blood vessels to act in certain ways in the brain. Um, 
one of the ones we see the most common is MSG. Right. Okay. Right. Um, too much salt. Um, you know, different food triggers. I've seen people that eat high animal animal fat diets. This trigger them. So in a lot of pe I've seen people that are dehydrated trigger these or have a lot right. of stress that triggers these. So a couple things is, of course, when you have a migraine, make sure you see a doctor to make sure it's nothing more serious. Right. You know, like mm -hmm. a brain problem. They usually do a CAT scan. But after that, they go through all the triggers. And I, I advise people to make sure they drink a lot of water. Try to eliminate caffeine if they can. Mm -hmm. Try to eliminate cheese and dairy and, and different processed foods. Then if they have a migraine, there's many different medications that can be helpful to treat it. One that came out this week that had a great story on it, uh, my friend Dr. Grieger published it on his nutritionfacts.org site, which is a wonderful site about nutrition. Mm -hmm. He said that for migraines, there's a drug out there called Imatrix or Sumatriptan okay. that people inject them when they, when they feel a migraine coming. But if a people will mix some ginger powder with some water, that's as effective as a treatment as wow. Imatrix. Wow. And, and if, I think if I remember correctly, it's like one third of a teaspoon, mix it in water and drinking, that's as much effective in staving off a migraine as, as right. the Sumatriptan. And you know, we all know that, that ginger has many powerful healing effects. Mm -hmm. It's very good at anti-inflammatory effects, but mm -hmm. now it looks like it has at least some help to help these vascular issues that happen. But most people, we don't want them to have a migraine, Nick. Right. So the goal is to find out what triggers it. Yep. And there's a whole list of things that can cause it. Um, there's some great websites, but that's, that's, those are some things. But I think that this interesting thing that, that Ginger can treat it, um, um, especially in an acute episode, is, is very exciting. Right. You know, it's incredible. We go through all this uh, pharmaceutical research to find these drugs, right. these wonder drugs that are going to fix everything. But, you know, sometimes there's better natural alternatives. That's right. And maybe there's going to be less side effects oh, from the ginger. Yeah, very few side effects other than it might, you might go, whoa. Yeah. You know, this has got a little pop to it. I have to brush your teeth and mouthwash yeah. afterwards. You know what? <laughs> I've been using um, ginger tea for inflammation. And they say, you know, ginger, as far as inflammation, as is equivalent, they've done some scientific studies, as a stronger anti-inflammatory called naproxen. It's the equivalent to that, at least. Okay. So I, when I have some inflammation in the body, I've been using that, and I've definitely noticed an improvement yeah. in my infl inflammation. Excellent. I've got very bad ankles. Ankles? My ankles um, get now, inflamed sometimes. Do these bother you all the time, or just sometimes? No, or just what, sometimes. What triggers sometimes it? Sometimes, if I, if I wear a certain pair of shoes or stand up a lot, it does it. I used to play basketball a lot and sprain my ankles a lot. Uh, okay. And yeah. a couple of years ago, I had a plantar fasciitis. That's mm -hmm. inflammation. And I gave a bunch of talks when I probably shouldn't have, and my mm -hmm. ankles got real swollen, and I really sort of took me a long time to recover from that inflammation. Yeah, yeah. Plantar fasciitis, Nick, is not fun. Uh, I'll take your word for it, and hopefully I never have to not experience fun. that. Okay. I'll tell you what, we've had a call come in from Helen, and okay. uh, she asks, can diabetes be shown by a lab test, and how is it diagnosed? That's a great question, Nick. Diabetes mellitus is a process where we have too much blood sugar um, in, 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 the, in the blood. And the sugar goes up and it you know, can't get into the cells as well and it causes symptoms like fatigue, going to the bathroom a lot. But one of the things is it triggers is you know, in type two diabetics, which most people have, mm -hmm. is you don't make enough insulin. You know, I mean, you don't you know, get the blood sugar in it. Right. And the real reason that we don't do it is because there's too much fat in the cells. So most people in diabetes, it's measured by either a blood sugar test, a fasting blood sugar, right. or something called a hemoglobin A1C, okay? okay. And that is as you take the molecule heme in your blood, that's the iron vessel that carries blood, and they actually measure how much sugar is attached to it. You know, like a, a number of eight is real too high. That means hemoglobin, 8% of, of sugar is attached to the hemoglobin. That's mm -hmm. way too high. Mm -hmm. So they can measure. And that's a good way because it measures blood sugar over months at a time rather than this one point in time. So it doesn't ruin it in case right. you ate something Right. Recently. So hemoglobin A1C is a test I would have, even though there's some other tests they can do. That's probably the one that we use the most. Right. Once you have diabetes, if it's a type type one is what the infants do because they don't make insulin. Right. And those people need insulin to be given. But for type two, if it's picked up early on, lots of times that can be treated with diet mm -hmm. and exercise. One hour of exercise is worth about five units of insulin. Right. And if you get fat out of the cells, then the sugar can get into the cells mm -hmm. so you don't need as much 
of, of all the bad things. Now, long-standing blood sugar problems, your insulin levels go up, that actually damages the blood vessels, and you get, they're more diabetics, are more prone to heart disease, more right. prone to strokes, more mm -hmm. prone to kidney problems. So mm -hmm. type two diabetes, um, we wanna get rid of that, and the key is get rid of fat. But I'm glad she's, Helen's asking, because the first thing is see if you have it, have That's your right. doctor check a hemoglobin A1C. Now, when they check this, is it like a... It's a blood test. A you vena puncture or you, you just can a do finger that. stick? You can do a finger stick, too. They have both ways now. It's according to how your doctor does it. I would recommend the most accurate is probably a vena puncture. Okay. Where they take, you know, the standard way of drawing it. But it can, we screen it in wellness checks just with the finger stick sometimes. Okay. That Excellent. can be done as well. Well, Helen, thank you for your call. We appreciate it, and we hope that answer uh, takes care of everything you wanted to know about diabetes and diagnosing it. We have another question from Catherine. She asks, can a heart... Uh, infection and tachycardia lead to a swollen aorta? Well, um, I'm not exactly sure what she means, but infections in the heart are, are, are not good, and we call right. that endocarditis, because usually infections get on the um, heart valves, okay? okay? There's other types of infections that just make the heart inflamed. Mm -hmm. We might call, we might get a condition that could called myocarditis, or the, the inf it's inflamed all over, okay? Right. Um, now, an aorta swollen, I'm not sure whether she means it got bigger, dilated, or caused an aneurysm. Right. Or, or it, got, it got, the infection caused inflammation of the aorta already, and that's called aortitis. But any inflammation in the heart, in theory, it could cause problems elsewhere in the body. Sure. Whether yeah. it causes an aneurysm, I, don't, I can't tell exactly what she means by a swollen aorta. Is that an aneurysm, which is a weak spot in the aorta where it gets enlarged? Um, it's possible. Um, I would check with your doctor to give you a really good answer. But any infection in the heart is not a good thing to have. Um, of course, we need to have that treated. The way we monitor it is with echocardiograms. We monitor the aorta to see if it's damaged. by Usually by, by CAT scans is the way we do that now, usually. Right. So you would recommend anybody, they're not sure what's going on with their heart. See and, your doctor. And maybe your cardiologist isn't yes. quite making it clear to you, maybe see a different cardiologist? Yep. Sometimes, you know, you want to be clear on this because knowledge helps cut down apprehension. Mm -hmm. When people are mm -hmm. anxious, their adrenaline goes up. It makes every condition worse. So make sure you get answers to these questions. But I'm not quite sure what she means with when she says swollen aorta. Right. I think she means it maybe got bigger and aneurysmal. And that is possible if you right. had the infection that would spread outside the heart. Well, Catherine, we hope maybe that helps you a bit. If not, go to our website at heartwiseministries.org. On the front page, you can click. There's a button that says Ask the Doctor, mm -hmm. and uh, you can submit your question via email through that form, and uh, Dr. Markham or one of his colleagues may uh, give you some advice and try and help make things clear for you. Or just go back to your cardiologist, whoever yeah. you've been seeing, and uh, try and, and get that really clear. And Nick, Nick, let me interrupt you here. The more yeah. detail they can put in the, the, the questions, the more specific answers right. I can give them and help guide them in the direction they should go. That's right. Thank you so much for being a part of our program tonight. We're going to be back in just a moment with more answers from Dr. Markham, so stay tuned. The Heart of Health Live will return in just a moment. As a medical professional, I've seen thousands of patients who have needed something more than modern medicine could offer. And over the past 20 years of practicing cardiology, I've discovered another method of treatment. Hi, I'm Dr. James Markham, and I'd like to introduce you to Biblical Prescriptions for Life. This is a Bible-based program designed to help you and your loved ones improve your health one step at a time. This evidence-based information focuses on relationships that empower change. Simple steps based on scripture are presented which will change your chemistry. This program focuses on changing the chemistry of the entire body rather than isolated chemical pathways. This program has the potential to eliminate the need for prescription medication and prevent chronic disease. Visit heartwiseministries.org to discover more about biblical prescriptions for life. I'd like to think that one day when we get to heaven, we're gonna see a list of people, people like Jared and Susan who were introduced to Jesus because of something we said, or maybe it was as simple as a passing smile but these people will look into their past and be able to say, I'm here 
because of you. Recently, you may have heard that HeartWise Ministries has begun spreading the gospel to the young, the old, the sick, and the healthy using this very television program, but we need your help. We want to take this type of medical programming to the non-believer and the person who has closed themselves off to traditional forms of outreach. If you believe as we do and want to support HeartWise so that together we can count more names on the tree of life, please consider donating today at heartwiseministries.org. That's heartwiseministries.org. Your life online doesn't change who you are, or does it? At heartwiseministries.org, you'll find the tools and encouragement that just might change your life. You can submit health questions and receive free advice from practicing physicians. Listen to HeartWise radio shows and watch our television programs, which are designed to help you make smarter choices about your health. And when you feel discouraged, request prayer in our prayer form and join us in praying for others. Because it's not only what you know about your health that matters, it's who you know. You've got questions, we've got answers on the Heart of Health Live. Welcome back. Thanks for staying with us. I'm Nick Evanson, your host for the evening, and here with Dr. Markham. And uh, we've been getting a lot of calls, so keep them coming. The phone number is 855-644-3278. And uh, we just had someone call in and ask about the film Plant Pure Nation, which Dr. Markham is a part of. He's in the, in the movie, and it comes out July 4th. And uh, it's a great, a great film. Uh, it has a lot of truth in it, even though it's maybe not from a religious perspective. And uh, if you want to learn more about that, you can go to their website at Plant purenation.com and uh, just google plant pure nation and you'll find out all about it and we also had someone who called in and asked about your books dr markham you've written two books one of which is the ultimate prescription yeah, yeah the last two is ultimate prescription mm -hmm. and medicines that kill and they can go on our website heartwiseministry.org right. you can go to amazon.com mm -hmm. um, the, the network three angels broadcast carries right. them too so there's lots of ways to get those books and read them and and let me know what you think and this person also asked you to just recap about ginger, about yeah. the healing properties of ginger. Ginger seems to have many different uh, um, natural properties, including mm -hmm. an anti-inflammatory. And what I like about ginger is there's been scientific studies on ginger comparing it to modern medicines, especially for inflammation. And one I referenced earlier is about a new, a new study that said it's for migraines, Mm -hmm. One third of a teaspoon, that's not very much, in a right. glass of water stirred up, drinking right. that before a migraine. That has, in this study, that's shown to prevent the migraine as effectively as a standard medicine that we use called Imatrix or Sumatriptan. So that's very exciting. I'm glad these studies are being done. As right. they come up, I will keep letting our listening odds know. There's lots of ones out there that probably do work but we just don't have the scientific studies showing this. But I really think we need some, some evidence-based medicine before we make big recommendations. Right. We've had another uh, question come in from Monroe, and he asks, uh, he has a left interior vesicular block, okay. and asks what can be done about this? Maybe okay. first, what is that blockage? Well, everything in our body ages at different ra rates, Nick. Okay. You know, some people, their brain ages, some people, their mm -hmm. ankles age is different, mm -hmm. you know, and some people, their wires of the heart, well, the, uh, these are different fascicles. These are conduction material of the heart that carries the, the conduction, the, the electrical signal that causes your heart to squeeze. Okay. Now, a left anterior fascicular block, as long as his heart's beating pretty good, is not a big deal. Mm -hmm. We pay attention of it a little bit because that means the signals, because it's a block, there's certain things we can see on the EKG. We can say, well, that signal's not moving through the heart as quick as it should. And there's different types. There's bundle branch blocks. Um, there's a sick sinus where the battery doesn't fire. Mm -hmm. And so your doctor will keep an eye on it because sometimes in a rare instance, um, certain medications might affect it. Um, and it can go on to, to where the heart doesn't pump as good. The signals don't get through. In that case, we can treat that very easily with a pacemaker. Right. So some people, and a person would be passing out or dizzy or heart going real slow. Um, hopefully, Monroe will never need that, but that's mm -hmm. what a fascicular block is. His doctor will evaluate him, ask him if he's having symptoms, maybe check an EKG. If he can't tell if it's a problem, he might even put a, a monitor on him that he wears for 24 hours. Right, right. Well, that's some helpful information there. Thank you, Monroe, for your question. Uh, now we're going to go to Fritz, who asks, how do, we re how do we reverse the damage of a stroke? 
Yeah, Fritz, that is very hard to do. And it's according to really, you know, the extent of the stroke. And the way they can tell this is with your CAT scans and MRI of the brain. Sometimes um, the damage to the brain, the brain has been damaged and it's irreversible damage. Well, the, a certain part has been damaged, but, you know, but sometimes other parts of the brain that can be retrained and take over. Okay, that's the good news. Um, but sometimes in a stroke um, that's damaged, we have to retrain it. There's certain exercises mm -hmm. we can do to get the blood flow to change it. But the neurologist is a specialist that will do this, Fritz. He'll look at the MRI. He'll work with you. But a lot of times the brain can be retrained and you can regain some functions. Unfortunately, sometimes it's not a perfect world. And a stroke is mean that the brain hasn't got enough blood and that part of the brain doesn't function right. Sometimes it doesn't come all the way back. Right. And sometimes we can't get collateral flow. But the good news even in that is we have a God that will heal us in his time. So even if we're the sickest, you know, as we can be, as long as we have that relationship, we're sure that our God's going to heal us in his time. That's right. It's a great question. You know, there's not many things that I've heard you say that you hate, but one thing that I have heard you say you hate is strokes. Yes, I do not like strokes because we don't have lots of good tr acute treatments for it. Right. Even though if you have a stroke in the first few hours and get to the hospital, we have some very powerful medicines that break up the clots. We also can go up in the brain and sometimes fish it out, but many people don't get in in time. Right. And then the blood flow goes to the, the brain, is damaged, that part of the brain dies. Some people can't talk and sometimes it's irreversible. One of the most common causes of stroke is a rhythm that I treat called atrial fibrillation. Mm -hmm. And we can lower stroke tremendously just by giving a blood thinner for that. Mm -hmm. So strokes scare me an awful lot because sometimes we don't regain our functional capacity. Right. And the brain is such a valuable organ, Nick, and that's why I'd want to do everything that we can to prevent a stroke. That's right. And, you know, eating good, keeping the stress down, um, all those things will help lower the risk of having stroke. Let's do a little prevention right now. What are some of the signs that someone is having experiencing a stroke? Yeah. Um, if anyone all of a sudden gets um, paralysis in, in their body, they can't move, usually it's on one side or the other. Right. Um, if he can't think right, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. if their speech becomes garbled, you know, mm -hmm. so mind doesn't think but speech doesn't grow right, get numbness on our body, right. those could be signs of an acute stroke. Um, that person would need to go into the emergency room right away and be transferred to a stroke center who might be able to save that part of the brain that's yeah. causing those symptoms. But yeah. strokes are very, very scary. You know, I don't like to go to the hospital. I like to be, try and be a tough guy and, you know, not, not be sick. But if you're experiencing any symptoms, always good to get them checked out sooner rather than later, right? Well, yeah, it is. And I heard, did you go in? I heard you had a bad bicycle wreck the other day. <laughs> did you go to the doctor for that one? No, no, I didn't. I, it was a small accident. I accidentally, some gravel got under my tire and I, I slipped over and I just got a little, little scrape on my arm here, but uh, nothing serious. I heard you scraped the bottom too. Yeah, I got, I got a little rash on me there. <laughs> well, be careful. You know, the competitive bikers, you know, you got to yep. slow down around those curves, Nick. That's we don't right. want you to hurt yourself. Yep, there's risks and rewards to everything we do. But, you know, exercise is good. Exercise is good, but maybe I need to be a little more controlled. Well, and that, that's a good point. <laughs> Remember, everything ages differently. Yes. And I tell right. my older patients that as they age, their brain might be a lot younger than the body parts. Mm -hmm. I had a fellow that his brain was 60, but his body was 90. Wow. And his, and his brain said that his body could do this, and he fell down and had a pretty big spill. Yeah. Okay. So sometimes, you know, the brain's, you know, younger than the other body. and You've got to sort of mm -hmm. control the brain and make sure you mm -hmm. don't overdo it in your right. exercise programs. So maybe, Nick, maybe your brain is younger than your body parts. I don't know. Maybe. Hopefully so. Let's we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Uh, tell you what, we've got a couple minutes here, but what is a uh, high blood pressure, what's a natural remedy for high blood pressure? Yeah, blood pressure, when people have high blood pressure, you want to know what causes it. If you're having pain, a natural remedy is to get rid of the pain, okay? If you have lots of worry and stress, that's that. But we're finding out a lot of people don't even have their blood pressure taken correctly now. They don't really have high blood pressure. So get it checked with a large cuff after you take 10 deep breaths, nice, slow, in a nice, relaxed atmosphere a couple times. So make sure you have it first. And then when you go to your provider, see if they can find out why. But natural things that lower the blood pressure, exercise. Right greens, mm -hmm. getting rid of fat in the diet. Um, and these are all scientifically done. Um, of course, we mentioned exercise, hibiscus tea, 
okay, can lower mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, getting uh, medical conditions treated that cause it, like sleep apnea, low thyroid, um, having stress reduction, stress management, all these things can help lower your blood pressure. And you mentioned sometimes people get their blood pressure misread. What, what causes them to falsely think that they have high blood pressure? Well, they go to the doctor and they're all excited and it, and it just shoots up for that right. 10 or 20 minutes. We call that white coat hypertension. Right. Or some people have a too tight of a cuff and it's right. too tight. It's on the wrong side. That can also spuriously elevate the blood pressure. So it's important to relax when you go to see the doctor so they don't Or get it checked before it. and then bring it in. All right, we're going to be back with more questions and answers from Dr. Margum. Stay tuned. The Heart of Health Live will return in just a moment. The Ultimate Prescription by cardiologist Dr. James Markham is taking the nation by storm. People everywhere are learning what living a healthy life is all about. If you're happy living a drug-filled, pain-filled, mundane existence, this book is definitely not for you. In this book, Dr. Markham dives into modern medicine's strengths and weaknesses and explains how lifestyle choices can significantly impact your health. To get your copy, visit Barnes & Noble or shop online at Amazon.com. This year, it's estimated that 56 million people will die. Some from old age, some from disease, and still others from terrible tragedies. At HeartWise, we can't do anything about sudden death, but what we can give you is free medical information that will help you live a longer, more full, with less disease and illness. If you are interested, heartache, if you have a medical question, or if you are just at the end of your rope, call us at 855-644-3278. At HeartWise, we believe in truth, love, and healing. You've got questions. We've got answers on the Heart of Health Live. Welcome back. We were just talking, and I can't believe we're in the last segment of the show. The time has gone so fast. Uh, but we've got a few more questions from people who have written in or called in. And uh, we thank you for your questions. And uh, Dr. Markham is excited to help answer them as best he can. And if you weren't able to get through tonight, we want you to go to our website at heartwiseministries.org. You can ask the doctor your questions. You can uh, submit a prayer request or pray for others who have submitted their requests. You can watch our live television programs. They're on the website for you anytime. And you can also listen to our radio programs called HeartWise. Those are half-hour programs. You can listen to them on our website anytime you feel uh, so inclined. So, uh, Dr. Markham, we've got a few more questions here. Uh, the first one comes from Elma. She asks, how can you safely get rid of abdominal fat? Yeah, a safely get rid of, that's a key word. Abdominal fat is a very tough thing. You're going to see all these advertisements on TV about how to mm -hmm. do it. But I would recommend the old-fashioned way, which is to try to, you know, go on a low-fat diet, you know, eat a healthy diet, get the calories down, do some type of regular abdominal exercising. Um, you know, the traditional ones of crunches, people don't think that's so great anymore. Mm -hmm. But just moving and exercise will burn the fat, whether that be swimming or something, get involved in an exercise program, cut back your fat. Sometimes it can go away totally, sometimes it can't go away totally. But, but that's the place, the safest way to do it is cut back calories, increase mm -hmm. activities. If you increase activities enough, sooner or later you will pull fat from your body if your calorie count is low enough. 
Now, Dr. Markham, I've been doing a little training myself yes. recently, trying to get in better shape. Uh, I ride bikes a lot, and unfortunately, oftentimes when I ride bike, it's at high intensity, causing me to yes. fall and scrape up my arm and my yes. side. But um, is high intensity workouts good for burning fat? No, and that's a great question. It's better to go long and slow to burn fat rather than short and quick. So make your exercisers longer and slower rather than shorter and quick. Yeah. That will burn more fat. It might be instead of walking for 30 minutes, you need to walk slowly for an hour, an hour and a, you yeah. know, an hour and a half during the day. Try never to sit more than, uh, you know, try always to get up and move every hour. Keep that metabolism going, lots of water, cut back those calories, and try to burn that fat yeah. off. That's the safest way to go. Yeah, and Elma, I have to, I can attest to that too. Lower frequency, uh, but more, or sorry, low intensity, but more frequency has really helped helped me out. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Luis on diet. It says, how healthy are low carb, high protein diets? Low carb, high protein diets. Yeah. The would that, paleo would that diet, be the paleo diet? Yes, we talked about that earlier not today. Not healthy. Yep. Okay. Um, it might cause you to lose weight, but mm -hmm. it's not healthy for all the reasons I mentioned earlier. Protein high content diets stimulate a lot of bad things to happen, including yeah. cholesterol production leading to heart disease. Mm -hmm. It's been shown to stimulate cancer, um, estrogen production, all sorts of things. Where we talked about acidosis in the right, body. Right. All those things happen. They're not good. I wouldn't recommend that diet. What about wheat belly? What is what is wheat belly and well, you know, I'm not sure exactly what they're 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 you know concerned, but you, the bottom line is you're going to hear a lot of fads, yeah. a lot of things out there, whether it be wheat belly or specific diet. But the healthiest diet you want to eat, you want to move towards, is a whole food, plant based diet. You want to eat most of your calories earlier in the day, not late at night, with lots of water, lots of movement during the day. Now, if you have a specific deficiency in your diet, something might need to be added, either certain types of food or supplements, but that's the thing that will help the most. Right. One more question. Okay, 10 seconds. 10 seconds. Somebody's been told they have to have a bypass surgery. They got quite a history. Are there any alternatives they can ask their cardiologist well, about? Yes, you know, you can talk about diet and exercise, and it really depends on the symptoms a person's having and where the blockages are. You can always get a second opinion. Um, I see yeah. many of those every day. Yeah. Well, Dr. Markham, thank you so much. I My know you take your time every Thursday okay. to be here, and we thank you, the viewers, for calling in with your questions and also for supporting HeartWise. If you think that this is a ministry that can uh, reach your friends and neighbors, share what we do with others, and also look on our website at ways you can support us. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time here at HeartWise. Hi, my name is Pastor John Bridges, and I am the Plan Giving Director for Secrets Unsealed. A simple way to make an affordable gift to Secrets Unsealed is to name us as a beneficiary of your retirement plan, life insurance policy, annuity, or bank account. To name or change a beneficiary, contact the financial institution or retirement plan administrator and request a change of beneficiary form. Decide what percentage of the account value you would like us to receive and name us along with the stated percentage on the beneficiary form. Thank you for remembering this ministry and please call us if you need assistance with this. Call 225-505-0231 and ask for Pastor John Bridges. Some TV.
Aloha. How are you folks doing today? Are you good? We've been studying a lot of wonderful things today, and our minds have been soaking it up. Hopefully, it's my great prayer that we would not only understand, but that God would give us the grace and the courage to apply the things that we've learned so far in this seminar. This is part eight of this 12-part series entitled The Art of End Time Preaching. And uh, this eighth presentation is one we've been kind of building up towards. It's a very practical one, but before we get into that, I just want to do a quick review of some of the things we've already covered. We've learned in our first presentations that preaching, the purpose of it is to give men and women a reason to believe so that they might be saved. And preaching is truth through personality. It's what is true through you. God wants to use us to proclaim the message because each and every one of us are unique. And our personal experience with God is something that God wants to use to reveal Himself in a different way to the world. For me, preaching is personal illumination that comes from divine revelation erupting in public proclamation. And we also learned in this seminar that God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believes. Why? Because it's an opportunity for Him to demonstrate His power through the weakness of humanity. We've also learned in this seminar that a compelling, complete, well-rounded sermon, Bible study, or message ought to be measured by seven, excuse me, eight features. Do you remember what they are? Number one, a biblical foundation. Number two, Christ focus. Number three, prophetic framework. Number four, practical function. Number five, logical flow. Number six, the friction of conviction. Number seven, strong finish. Number eight, spirit filled. Eight features that we ought to measure a sermon by in order for it to be complete and compelling. It ought to have those eight features. And then in our last presentation, our last few presentations, we talked about the message of the Master, how Jesus gave the message, the Sermon on the Mount, and we saw that there are four parts to that sermon. Number one, a captivating introduction. Number two, a convincing interpretation. Number three, a convicting application. And number four, a compelling close. And then we looked at the Sermon of the Serpent in the wisdom of tactfulness. And as we bring all of these things together, now we want to take a look at how we practically craft the sermon from beginning to end. The process by which a sermon is conceived, developed, and born. And so in the eighth presentation, we're talking about the organization, the managing of the material, 13 steps in sermon preparation. And so I hope you brought your Bibles. I hope you have your notebooks, your worksheets, your writing utensils. What is the most important thing we need? The Holy Spirit, because He's the greatest teacher of all. So please bow your heads with me as we ask the Holy Spirit that He would be with us today. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you again for all the wonderful things we've been learning. Lord, we pray that you would help us not only to understand, but help us to retain and help us to apply these things, that we would experience the power of your Holy Spirit working not only in, but through us, in the hearts of those around us. Lord, we recognize that we're living in the last days. We're living in a world that is not safe, a world where chaos and confusion abounds all around us. And yet, God, you've given us your word, the answers and the solutions found in the gospel. And now, Lord, we're here because we want to be a sharp instrument in your hand. We want to be competent and creative and compelling communicators for you in these solemn times. So teach us how now, Lord. Give us an attentive mind and help us to soak up like a sponge every principle and promise you have given us in your word. This is our prayer, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our message in part number eight Talk about the organization of preaching, the managing of, of the material, 13 steps in sermon preparation. I want to begin by sharing with you 
how Jesus distilled and summarized to us what it means to have eternal life. Jesus said in the book of John chapter 17 and verse 3, and this is life eternal, that they might, what? Know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Here Jesus makes it plain that eternal life is not found in what we know, but in who we know. That when we know Him, that in and of itself is life eternal. But we have to understand, friends, that to know God is much more than an intellectual assent to the recognition that God is real. For the devil knows that God is real, and yet he's lost. You see, in the English language, the word know is a very shallow word. It simply denotes understanding in the mind. But in biblical terms, the word know is so deep. It has a deep connotation. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1 that, that Adam knew Eve and she conceived and bore a son. So the word know has the connotation of oneness, of two coming together in intimacy and an encounter in a personal love relationship. And that's how God wants us to know Him more than head knowledge. He wants us to have a heart experience with Jesus. And friends, when we know God, to know God is to love God. And when we know Him, we're going to want to make Him known to others as well. Amen? Bible says in Psalms 46, verse 10, Be still. Other translations say, Hush. And know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. One of the things I catch from this text is that in order for God to be exalted, we first must be still. We must take time to be silent, to listen to the voice of God speaking to us individually and personally through the pages of prophecy and the writings of Holy Scripture. Because that's how God makes Himself known to us. It's the primary way that God has revealed Himself to man. It's through the written word, which is a reflection of the living word. And so when we take the time to be still, then we can know God. And when we know God, then we can exalt Him amongst the nations. In other words, the exaltation of Christ is the result of knowing Christ. You see, my friends, it is in the womb of the mind and the heart that sermons are conceived. This conception is the result of the union of divinity and humanity coming together. Divinity comes in and humanity is implanted with the seed of truth. And after a period of incubation, that seed grows in the womb of our mind and heart. And after a period of time, it grows into a sermon and a sermon is birthed and delivered behind the pulpit. And those of you who are mothers, you know that labor comes before delivery. Isn't that right? Same thing with sermon, preparation. Labor comes before delivery. And so in this presentation, we want to take a look at how this, what this process actually and practically looks like, how it begins. The conceiving, the growing, the birthing, and the delivering of a sermon in 13 steps. Here's how it begins. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, the Bible says that we need to do what? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We must take time to study, to be still, to have that encounter with God, studying to gather up the content for the sermon meal, gathering up the, 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 the materials for the sermon house. Now, what are these materials? What are the ingredients to the sermon meal? Well, there are primary sources and there are secondary sources. We talked about this before. The primary sources of the sermons that we're writing is, number one, the Bible, number two, the spirit of prophecy, and the book of nature. These are the primary ways God has revealed Himself to us. The Bible, the spirit of prophecy, which is like a divine commentary on the Bible, and the book of nature, because through creation, the Creator is seeking to reveal Himself. These are the objective sources. But then there are also subjective sources we can draw from. That is our own personal experience, the providential leadings of God in our own lives, how He has answered our prayers and opened doors and closed doors and how He's led us 
in our past. But then there are personal thought journals. Now these are not like typical journals where you journal how your day was, but rather journals where you write down impressions and illustrations and things you've been learning, uh, thought journals where you, can, where you can draw out sermon material from. But then also the product of other minds, whether it be good books you've read, classes you've taken, ser seminars you've attended, and sermons that you've listened to. Nothing wrong with drawing from those sources to receive inspiration to write sermons. So those are the subjective sources. We have primary, which are the objective sources, secondary or subjective sources. These are the ingredients or the sources where we get the ingredients for the sermon meal we're putting together. Now, how do these organic materials come together to actually create a sermon? Now, what I wanna do is I wanna read you from several homiletic books and individuals, Bible teachers and students and whatnot, and how they have described the process of the, of the conceiving, growing, and birthing of a sermon. I wanna read them to you so that you can kinda of see what the experts are saying. In the book, Preaching to the Times, Charles Bradford described it in this way. The preacher needs to know something about his own mind and how it works. The processes that are going on as the message takes, takes shape. The first stage, working with the text or passage exegetically, doing word study and getting into the scripture is like gathering, building material. The pattern seems to be first, the idea a flash of insight, a fleeting image. Then there is a pursuit, a time of intense mental effort until the brick wall of limitation brings frustration. Have you ever experienced that study? Like you're, you're, you're trying to find something, you're, you, you're inspired by a word or a thought or a verse or a story and then you begin to study it and you're looking for the depth of meaning within it but sometimes you don't find it right away. You encounter a brick wall of frustration. All this has been taking place in the conscience. The preacher is in control of the thought processes. Now comes the period of incubation, when the matter is referred to the basement of the subconscious, where all the preacher has ever learned comes into play. Cross-fertilization and synthesis take place. After some time in the basement, the idea surfaces. This is the period of insight revelation and clarification. Out of our creative brooding, out of our creative what? You know what that word brooding means? To think deeply about something. Out of our creative brooding over the chaos of ideas, mental images, and thought patterns, there comes light and some form. Remember that even in creation, the world was not complete until six days. The Creator lifted the veil in seven successive, successive stages. The preacher needs to know what is going on in his own mind. So sometimes you sit down and begin to write a sermon or prepare a Bible study. You don't get the whole thing at once. Sometimes it takes years to write a sermon. I got sermons I've been working on for years, still working on them. And so don't be frustrated if you don't get it all at once. There's a process to this experience. In the Biblical Preacher's Workshop, page 75, another homiletic book, I want you to notice how this writer describes this experience. The conceiving, developing, and birthing of a sermon or a message. A sermon is not so much made as grown, not so much built as received. That the ideas of a sermon must be given time to sink deep into the emotions of the preacher and then to rise organically out of his whole life, enriched by memory, fired by conviction. No preacher can do his task of preaching, excuse me, no preacher can do his task of preparing biblical sermons as a mere technician, however disciplined. He will need the deeper and more subtle discipline of the creative artist. Here's another one. Now from the book Evangelism, page 181. Ellen White says, the speaker must prepare himself for the task. Talking about sermon preparation. He must not ramble all through the Bible, but give a clear, connected discourse, showing that he understands the points that he would make. My friends, these statements that we just read 
are simply arguing that there is a process that takes place. A process by which sermons are conceived, developed, and born, and not every process for every single person is exactly alike. However, there is a process. A process of gathering and organizing the material. In Evangelism page 648, it says it like this. Those who teach the Word of God should not shun mental discipline. Every worker or company of workers should, by persevering effort, establish such rules and regulations as will lead to the formation of correct habits of thought and action. Such a training is necessary not only for the young men, but also for the older workers, in order that their ministry may be free from mistakes and that their sermons may be clear, accurate, and convincing. I want to experience that. How about you? Amen? A ministry free from mistakes. And then it says, we read this earlier, by the way. In, I want to read it again because it's a powerful statement. It says, some minds are like an old curiosity shop more than anything else. Many odd bits and ends of truth have been picked up and stored away there, but they know not how to present them in a clear, connected manner. It is the relation that these ideas have to one another that gives them value. Every idea and statement should be as closely united as the links in a chain. When a minister throws a mass of matter before the people for them to pick up and arrange and in order, his labors are lost, for there are few who would do it. That's the truth. And so, how do we do this? Here's another one. In another homiletic book, Heralds of God, page 1. 54. Notice how this writer described it. Again and again in your reading of the Bible, phrases, sentences, and whole passages will leap out from the page, each of them positively thrusting itself upon you and clamoring, one day you must preach on me. You ever experienced that? You're reading the Bible and something just grabs you, convicts you, and moves you, and you're like, man, I got to share this. It's like, the, it's like the verses saying, preach me, <laughs> share me. That's called inspiration. This is where your private notebooks come into action. When a text has once gripped you, do not let it escape. Jot it down at the head of the page, and underneath it, any thoughts, illustrations, potential sermon divisions that the text may have brought with it. In other words, friends, when you receive inspiration, an impression of the Holy Spirit from the reading and the studying of the Bible, of a sermon idea, don't let it escape. Write it down as soon as it comes into your mind. Don't allow the devil time to cause his birds to snatch away the seeds of truth before they take root in the soil of your mind. And then in the same book, on the same page, there's an illustration that is given. Notice this illustration. There is a tragic page in the biography of Hector Berlioz. Any of you know who he is? I figure there's a lot of musicians here. Somebody has to know who this guy is. Anyways, I don't know who he is, but he's, a, he's, he's a, one of those uh, music composers. There's a tragic page in the biography of Hector Berlioz, the composer, which tells how one night there came to him, quite suddenly, an inspiration for a new symphony. The theme of the first movement, an allegro, which is a brisk tempo, was ringing in his head. He heard the symphony in his head. He knew he ought to capture it there and then and set the music down in manuscript, but he refrained. The following night, it returned, that, that music, that inspiration for a new symphony. It returned, and again he heard the allegro clearly and sang it to himself and even seemed to see it written down. But again he failed to take his pen. The next day when he awoke, all remembrance of it was gone. The lovely melody, melody refused to be recaptured, and the symphony, which might have thrilled the world, was never written. Let that sad episode be a warning. And so, when the Holy Spirit impresses you with a message, write it down. Amen? One time I had a dream. And in this dream, it was like God was showing me text after text. 
and, and something I'd never learned before, never seen before, and, and, I, and I'm, I'm embarrassed and ashamed to say that I did not wake up right away and write it down. I thought, when I wake up the next morning, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look that up. I woke up the next morning, gone. <laughs> and so let that be a warning. And so, how exactly do we assemble the mass of matter? What are the steps? You see, many people have different methods and steps in creating a sermon. There's no one size fits all. However, there must be a consistent process used by the competent communicator. And we're going to look at one of those many processes in this presentation. Now, before we do so, it's important for us to understand that there are different kinds of sermons people, that, that, that we can preach. Three, three types of sermons I want to share with you this evening. There's the topical sermon. This is the sermon based upon a topic in the scriptures. Not so much one passage or one verse, but a topic that's found in all of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. An example of a topical sermon would be a sermon about the seven-day Sabbath. Because it's not found in one place, it's found in many places. So in the topical sermon, you would look up all the places where that topic is found throughout the Bible. You would list them and compare Scripture with Scripture. And as you compare the Scripture with, with itself, the truth of that topic becomes clear and, and it emerges for us to understand. Because not one or two verses say everything about a specific topic. But when we gather all the cooperating verses, that's when we know what the truth is. The truth about the state of the dead is a topical sermon. Uh, even about the sanctuary, that would be considered topical. Health would be topical. These are sermons where you're gathering verses from all over the Bible and you're comparing Scripture with Scripture. Those are topical sermons. But then there are textual sermons. Textual sermons are based on a passage of Scripture. Maybe one or two verses. That is, that, 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 that is revealing a specific truth about God or a specific truth about humanity, a, a, a textual sermon will basically go through that verse, that, that small passage, and it would juice and extract all the meaning, all the truth, and all the application from that singular verse. Now, that does not mean that that is the only verse that it's, that's presented in the sermon. There might be other verses used in the sermon, but those other verses are only used to to, to make clearer that particular text. That's what we call the textual sermon. But then there's the best one of all, in my opinion, the expository sermon. The expository sermon is based on an entire unit of Scripture. Most of the time, it's based upon an entire story or a narrative in the Bible. And what the expository sermon does, it basically tells the story from beginning to end, the entire plot, and as it goes through the story, it extracts all the truths and the applications and the implications in that particular story. That's what we would call the expository sermon. Now, some people have expounded and, 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 and have uh, categorized different sermons into more than just three. But for the sake of simplicity, these are the three main types of sermons that you can preach. Topical textual, and expository. So now that we understand the different kinds of sermons, now we want to take a look at the 13 steps in the managing of the material. And again, there are some individuals whose process requires more. They, they, they expound upon it with more than 13. Others have simplified it with fewer steps. There is no one side, one size fits all, but here's what works for me. The conceiving, growing, and birthing of a sermon in 13 steps. And so let's go through them together. It's very practical. Number one, write it down. Choose the text or the theme. Choose the text. Choose the topic. Now, you may choose it, but it also may choose you. That's what we call inspiration. Sometimes Holy Spirit just impresses you. This is what I want you to preach on. This is the verse you need to focus on. This is the subject that needs to be shared in this moment in time. You may choose it, sometimes it may choose you. But most of the time, it requires sanctified judgment to choose the text or the theme or the subject that's most relevant for the occasion. So where does this sanctified judgment come from that helps us to determine what text, topic, subject is most relevant to share? Three 
places this sanctified judgment comes from. Number one, your connection with the Lord, of course. God impresses us through His Holy Spirit as we study His Word. And so when we're connected with God, God will give us wisdom. Number two, our connection with the people. As we mix and mingle amongst the people, listening to conversations and connecting with people, we can know what their need is, their trials are, their struggles that they're facing. And when we know the need, then we can point to the supply. So your connection with God, your connection with people. And number three, your connection to the times. Understanding what's happening in the world, the moods of history, the concerns of the modern mind. This will help us to to, to know what is the most relevant thing we can share according to what is happening in the world. It gives us an idea of what topic, text, or theme we should preach on. Now, other ways we can determine what text to choose is based upon the calendar, what's happening throughout the year, the church calendar, even the secular calendar. Sometimes there's holidays and anniversaries and memorials and special occasions and historical events. And during that time of year, people are thinking about certain things. And so sometimes, because people are already thinking about it, we can use those events to teach spiritual lessons. Now we know that during the Christmas season, people are thinking about the birth of Christ. Now we know that Jesus was not born during that time. We know that there are pagan origins to it, but nonetheless, people are thinking about it. So there's nothing wrong with preaching a sermon about the first coming of Jesus and the greatest gift of all. Let's use it as a time to evangelize. Let's take advantage of that opportunity. During Easter, people are thinking about the resurrection. Well, most people think about uh, Easter eggs and whatnot. And we know that there are pagan origins behind that. But nonetheless, nothing wrong with preaching a message on the resurrection. Fourth of July, Independence Day, maybe a sermon on what freedom really looks like. True freedom, spiritual freedom, freedom from sin, amen? We're using events and holidays to be able to help people to see the bigger picture of spiritual things. At the end of October, there's another holiday. and During that time, perhaps we should preach a message on the Reformation. Not Halloween, but the Protestant Reformation. And so we, we can take advantage of those times of the year. Remember, friends, just because something is pagan doesn't automatically mean it's wrong or evil. Now, some of you are surprised by that. A lot of things that are pagan are wrong and evil and we should avoid, but just because something is pagan doesn't automatically mean that we need to reject it. You know why? Because the, days of, the names of the days of the week are pagan, and that doesn't stop us from calling Monday, Monday. You see, something is only wrong if it violates the Scripture. Amen. There's nothing wrong with traditions and culture in and of itself. It only becomes wrong when it violates the Word of God. And if something goes against God's Word, those things must be surrendered. Why? Because we ought to obey God rather than men. Amen? And so we can use these things. And so the first step, choose the text. The second step, write it down, observe the text. Observe the text. What do I mean by that? Here's what I mean. In the observation of the text, read that passage several times in several different versions of the Bible. Read it several times in several different versions. And as you do, take notice of the following. The sentence structure of the text. Unusual words or phrases in the text. Take notice of any repetition, emphasis of words or ideas. Look for the synonyms in the text. Take notice of any contrasts or comparisons that are made. A contrast of words, ideas, or things. Pay attention to the names and the places in the text. The actions and the reactions the causes, and the effects. So you're reading the text. You're observing it, though. Read it several times in several different versions, versions of the Bible and observe these following things. What you're doing in this step is you're brooding. That means you're thinking deeply. You're not just surface reading to get through it, but you're actually thinking about the structure. You're thinking about the words. You're brooding. You're thinking deeply. And as you observe those things, then the next thing, ask questions to the text. Ask the Bible questions 
and listen to how the Bible answers it. What are some questions we can ask? Who? What? Where? When? Why? And how? Now, you may not get an answer to every one of those questions in that text, but see what answers you do get from the text. Ask the question, what is the writer saying here? To whom is he addressing? Who is he speaking to? What are the circumstances to which he wrote? And what is the liter literary form of this particular passage? Am I reading the historical part of the Bible? The poetic part? Am I reading prophecy? Is this biography? What is the literary structure of this particular passage? Take note of those things. And then, under the same step, we're brooding, we're observing the text, we need to take note of our earliest impressions of the text. For example, write down the influential words of the text. Other connecting passages that may come to your mind as you're reading that specific text. Maybe there's another verse that kind of matches or supports that same verse. Write it down. Pictures that come to mind. Illustrations that come to mind. And even personal experience that confirms the truthfulness of that text. Maybe you've experienced that yourself. Write those things down. Don't worry about organizing it. You're not organizing in this step. You're just gathering all the building blocks. You're gathering all the materials. This is the second step, the brooding, the observing of the text. In this step, you're being pulled into the text. You're marinating your soul in the juices of the text. I like how, what, how this book describes this process. In the minister's workshop, page 160, here's what one writer, how one writer described it. The fruitful reading of the Bible is a sort of brooding, not frantic reading. Rather, it is watching the narrative pass before one's mind, holding the mind loose with no tension or tautness at all, not worrying whether one finds anything or not. The key point is that one is not working for a particular end. In other words, you're not studying the Bible to try to prove a pre-opinionated idea you have. You're just trying to find out what the Bible is teaching with no pre preconceived notions of what you think, with no human assumptions of what you think it means. You're observing the text. And then it says, the mind broods over the page like a hawk over a chicken yard. Do you see the picture? A hawk flying over a chicken yard looking for his next meal. The mind does the same thing as we're, as we're watching, as we're observing the Bible. The mind, like a hawk over a chicken yard, then from a leisurely wheel in the air, it swoops down on what looks like an idea. Now, you don't always get a live chicken. Sometimes it turns out to be merely a hole in the ground. Don't fret about that. The chief thing is the habit, the procedure. It's the process. It's the brooding process, the observation of the text. That's the second step. Then the third step, write it down, we then need to study the text. This is the exegesis, the studying of the text. What do we do in this, in this phase? We're looking up all the, the definition of all the influential words and meanings in the text that may not be apparent in the surface. How do we extract the meaning of the words? We use the dictionary. You can use the English dictionary, but make sure you also use the lexicons and the, uh, diction, the, the Greek and Hebrew dictionaries that gives us the original language, the meaning in the original language. And then we also look up those words in that text in the concordance and cross-references. That determines the meaning of those words by how it's used in other places of the Bible. We look up the meaning of the text in the original language, but we also look how that same word English, as well as Greek and Hebrew, is used in other places of the Bible, and we thus derive its definition by its usage. Because, friends, it was the same Holy Spirit that inspired all the different writers of the books of the Bible. Amen? And in this phase, we also want to look up the context, the historical context, the history, the culture behind during that time, and many Bible commentaries are helpful for that. The Bible commentaries uh, show the, 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 the theme and the, 
the historical context of the different books of the Bible. This is in the third step, the studying of the text. I like what it says here in Christ Object Lessons, page 109. Talking about the Bible. It says, His words are truth. And they have a deeper significance than appears on the surface. All the sayings of Christ have a value beyond their unpretending appearance. Minds that are quickened by the Holy Spirit would discern the value of these sayings. They would discern the precious gems of truth, though these may be buried treasures. In other words, don't just stay on the surface. Go deeper. Just like the gold miner has to dig beneath the surface to find the vein of gold. And just like the scuba diver has to go beneath the surface to see the wonders of God's creation, so too does the Bible student have to go beneath the surface reading. He has to go deeper. That's the third step. Study the text. And then when you look up all those things, read the passage again in light of what you found in the original languages, in the Bible commentaries. Now the scripture should be speaking more clearly and the spirit speaking more distinctly to you. That's the, that's the third step. And then the fourth step, you want to now find the truth and application in the text. Find the truth and application in the text. Write down every principle of truth contained in that passage verse by verse. What does this truth tell me about God? What does this truth tell me about Satan? What does it tell me about myself? What does it tell me about sin? What does it tell me about faith? Find all the truths in that text, write it down, and then write down the practical implication and application of those truths. And what you're doing here is more than picking out a few nuggets of truth, you're looking for the theme, the structure, the design, the outline of that revelation. And so write down in this fourth step how that principle applied then and how it applies now. What is the truth that this verse is actually teaching me? Summarize it, distill it into a few words or a simple sentence. What is the truth and what is the application in this text. That's step number four. Step number five, consult the spirit of prophecy and other biblical commentaries on that passage. You see, it's a well accepted principle of hermeneutics that later prophets enlarge, explain, and interpret the words of earlier prophets. The New Testament explains the Old Testament. And so, it would be well for us to consult the spirit of prophecy. What does the spirit of prophecy say concerning that story, that topic, that specific passage? I believe, friends, that the spirit of prophecy is like a divine commentary on the Bible. You know, a lot of times we want to skip steps two, three, and four and go to straight to number five, but it would be better for us to study the Bible first. Amen? Find the truth in God's word first. The spirit of prophecy only clarifies that which is already in the Bible. Friends, the spirit of prophecy doesn't add to the Bible and it doesn't take away from the Bible. It simply magnifies what's there. If you're to put a magnifying glass over the Bible, will that magnifying glass take something out or put something in, yes or no? What is it gonna do? It's simply gonna make clearer and larger that which is there. And I believe that's what the spirit of prophecy does. It simply makes it clear and larger. And you know why God saw it necessary for us to give us this special gift in these last days? is because we are the blindest generation of all. And so we need special help to see, right? The church of Laodicea is blind. And so God has given us a special gift to help us to see more clearly how the ancient words of the Bible apply to the modern age. The principles are in the Bible, but the spirit of prophecy shows more clearly how they can act, how they apply more specifically in the last days. And so in the, in the fifth step, consult the spirit of prophecy. And friends, if, if the Holy Spirit is leading you, you'll discover that what you have discovered in the first steps in studying the Bible, the spirit of prophecy either confirms it or corrects it. <laughs> Amen. And so write down everything you find 
not worrying about organizing it yet. In the first five steps, you're gathering all the building blocks for the sermon house. You're gathering all the ingredients for the sermon meal. After you've done that, step number six, which is probably the hardest step. Step number six, determine the main point of the passage. The main point of what you have just studied. This helps us to take aim and focus as to where we are going. It is the theme that gives coherence to the sermon structure. So as you have gathered all of this information, right? From your exege exegesis of the text, verses that come to mind, illustrations that come, you have all of this information. It's not organized. It's just a bunch of information you've written down. As you examine that information, ask yourself, what is the thing that's being repeated? What is the thing that's being emphasized? What is the main thing that God is saying here? And try to summarize it in one sentence. And when you can find, when you can find that main point, that main point is the theme that you should keep in mind as you move to the next steps. So how do you find the theme? Oh, well, friends, the theme should naturally emerge as you examine the exegesis of the passage. You have to ask, of all the truths that I've, I've, I've seen and extracted from this passage, which one is central? Which one is foundational? Which one is the most potent point? You have to distinguish between the main point and other peripheral points because there's a lot you can get from one passage, right? There's a lot of things you can get. So distinguish between peripheral points and the main central point. Now, why is it important to discover this first? Let me explain. Because a, ser a sermon is like a music symphony. Let me illustrate it like this. You've been to a symphony before? You have a symphony here, right, in, in, in Weimar. A sermon is like a music symphony. Now, a symphony is usually set around one main tune, right? A main tune. In the same way, a sermon ought to be, ought to have a main tune or a main point or a main theme. And when a symphony begins, usually when it begins, that theme, that tune, is played slowly and simply on one singular instrument. In the same way, when you begin a sermon, you have to share that main point, that main theme in one simple sentence, and that will give your hearers an indication of where you're going. And then as the symphony continues from at first being played, simp uh, the, at first the tune being played simply on one instrument, then other instruments gradually surround that same tune and that same music. Other instruments are brought in that gives more character to the theme, to the tune. In the same way, in the sermon, after you've stated your objective, your main point, now you bring other points, other instruments or points, but the purpose of those other points is, su is to support your main point. Then as the symphony continues, there are variations of that same tune that's played differently to give more color and character to the symphony. That main tune is played soft, then it's played loud. It's played slow, then it's played fast. It's played in the major chord, and it's also played in the minor chord. And each variation of that tune reaches a different set of people. And that's the same thing with, with a sermon. You take that main point, and then you share it in different ways, showing how it applies in different situations, thus, thus reaching different people that you're speaking to. Not every person is going to respond to the same tune that is played or the same application that is made. Does that make sense? Now, in the close of a symphony, Usually there's a spine-tingling crescendo of the original theme, thus fixing the memory of the music into the hearts of the hearers forever. And that's what the close of the sermon ought to do. You're summarizing. You're, it's, it's the climax of the sermon. And in that climax, you're summarizing the main theme that you had introduced simply in the beginning. And then you're closing it, calling for an appeal so that the people would never forget 
the main point or theme that you had made in the message. A sermon ought to be like a symphony. Now, it is essential to find the theme of the message first before you write the rest of the sermon. Why? Because if you don't know the theme, you're not going to know where you're going. You're going to be distracted by other points, and as a result, you'll end up writing a sermon that's way too long with too many points. And too many points, people won't be able to remember it. Now, if you discover that there is more than one theme in the passage or text you're studying, if there's more than one main point, then you have discovered a series of sermons, not one. So you got to break it up into a series. Does that make sense? All right. Now, here are some questions you can ask to determine the value and effectiveness of a sermon. Here are some questions you can ask as you're trying to find out the theme, as you have all of this information and you're trying to organize it into something that is clear and connected, here are some questions you can ask. Can I state the purpose of this sermon in a single declarative sentence unencumbered by subordinate clauses or conjunctions? In other words, can I summarize what I'm saying in one sentence? Can I state the content of the sermon in a similar sentence? Can I mark the progression of the, of the sermon in a straight line that runs without deviation from the first word to the final word? Can you mark the progression of the sermon with a straight line without any deviation from the first to the final word? And when you ask these questions, you're, you're solidifying, you're focusing on the main point of the sermon. Joseph Scriven, a loving Irish young man, had just returned back to his hometown near Dublin after finishing his university education. It felt good to be back home and see familiar faces. But there was one person Scriven was especially anxious to see. His childhood love. Scriven could barely wait for the day when he would take her hand in marriage. His future could not seem brighter. The day before the wedding, they decided to meet by the banks of the River Ban. Scriven's fiance rode to meet him. As she got close to the river, suddenly the horse startled. And in a terrifying moment, she was thrown headlong to the river, knocking her unconscious. Moments later, Joseph arrived, but she had already drowned. As they pulled her body out of the water, he looked into the face of the woman he was to marry the following day. The day he had anticipated for so long, but now would never happen. In anguish of soul, Scriven turned to his closest friend, to God for comfort and help. Scriven later decided to leave Ireland. He traveled to Canada, where he would live the rest of his life. There, he dedicated his life to serve and love those in need. One day, Scriven was hired by a retired sea captain to tutor his children. Here, 
he met the captain's niece, Eliza Roach. After some time, they fell in love and made plans to get married in the spring. A few weeks before the wedding, Eliza contracted pneumonia. Although Joseph cared for her diligently, she died before they could get married. With a broken heart, Joseph again turned to the best source of comfort he knew, the God he called his best friend. He didn't see him as a distant deity or a force to be feared, but rather as an intimate friend in whom he could confide and receive strength in his darkest time. The following year, after learning of his mother's illness, he wrote a letter of encouragement to her, and he included a personal poem that expressed this intimate friendship with God, which had sustained him through the hardest trials of his life. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and grief to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. No, no, no. 
sweet portion there. Through all our trials, we have a never-failing helper. He doesn't leave us alone to struggle with temptation, to battle with evil, and be finally crushed with burdens and sorrow. Though now he is hidden from mortal sight, the ear of faith can hear his voice saying, Fear not, I am with you. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. I have endured your sorrows, experienced your struggles, encountered your temptations. I know your tears. I also have wept. The griefs that lie too deep to be breathed into any human ear, I know. Think not that you are desolate and forsaken, though your pain touch no responsive chord in any heart on earth. Look unto me and live. The mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord, that hath mercy on thee. A 60-second soldier, one minute of fast facts for defending your faith. The run-in with sin. Sin is born. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 through 17, a perfect angel becomes a rebel. Ezekiel chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, Satan wanted to be like God, like the Most High. Genesis chapter 3, verses 5 through 7, Adam and Eve sinned, listening to Satan's lies. Genesis chapter 3, verses 22 through 24, God drove them out of the Garden of Eden, barred them from the Tree of Life. The wages of sin, Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Adam's sin opened the door for sin to infect all of mankind. Ah, the rescue. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, the sinless became sin so that we might have the chance at righteousness. John chapter 1, verse 29, Jesus came to take away the sins of the world. Remember, study to show thyself approved.
Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Once again, Father, we come before your throne boldly this evening in the name of Jesus, requesting that you will be present in our midst through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that you will help us understand what we are going to study. And as we study today and tomorrow, we ask that you will help us understand not only academically who the 24 elders are, but how they are occupied in fulfilling your will in the universe and the lessons that we can learn from the way in which they work. And so be with us, and we thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Now, in our last study together, we analyzed the characteristics of the 24 elders. And we notice that according to Scripture and the spirit of prophecy, the 24 elders are strong angels. They are the highest of angels that have been placed to represent the worlds that never sinned. Now, we notice the characteristics that identify the 24 elders. But today we are going to look at the same subject, but from a different perspective. What we're going to do is follow a process of elimination. We're going to show who the 24 elders are not. Because sometimes by known, knowing who they are not, we can know who they are. So we're looking at it from two different perspectives, who they are and who they are not. Now we want to begin by noticing that the 24 elders are not cherubim or seraphim. Go on with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 4 and verse 4, where the 24 elders are described. It says there, around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. So notice the 24 elders are sitting on thrones, and they have crowns on their heads, and they're around the throne. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 4 and verse 6. Here's another group. This is a distinct group. It says in verse 6, Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. And then let's go to verse 8 where these living creatures are identified. It says in verse 8, The four living creatures, each having six wings, full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Now, we already noticed that in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 3, creatures that have six wings are seraphim. And in Isaiah 6, the seraphim are singing, Holy, 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 just like the four living creatures are here in Revelation chapter 4. So very clearly, Revelation 4 shows us that the 24 elders who are sitting on thrones and have crowns on their heads are distinct and different than the four living creatures that are in the midst of the throne. They are two different groups. So the 24 elders are not cherubim or seraphim. Now here's another question. Are the 24 elders part of the angelic hosts, the 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of angels that stand around the throne of God. Can we say that the elders are the same as the angelic host? Once again, no. These 24 elders are not part of the throng of angels that surround God's throne. Go with me to Revelation chapter 5 and verses 11 and 12. Revelation 5, verses 11 and 12, where the 24 elders are distinguished from the angelic hosts. It says there, in Revelation 5, 11, Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Question, are the 24 elders part of the angelic hosts? Absolutely not, because we're told here, 
I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, and the elders. The throng is distinguished from the elders. So the elders are not part of the 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of angels. Now somebody might be saying, well Pastor Bohr, maybe the 24 elders are part of the host that cannot be numbered from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Perhaps the 24 elders belong to that group from every nation on earth. Once again, the answer is no. Notice Revelation chapter 7, Revelation chapter 7, and verses 13 and 14. Revelation 7 verses 13 and 14. Uh, we covered this conversation in a previous study together. John sees in verse 9 this great multitude which no one can number forever, from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And so then one of the elders speaks to John, and I want you to notice what he says in verse 13. Then one of the elders answered saying to me, who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. Question, are the 24 elders part of the unnumbered host from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people? Absolutely not, because the elder is asking the question of John who that group is. In other words, the elder does not belong to the unnumbered host host from every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Now you're probably wondering then why Revelation 5 verses 9 and 10 tells us that uh, the 24 elders were redeemed from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. We're going to cover that issue a little bit later on. Are you understanding so far? Are the elders part of the angelic hosts? No. Are they part of the cherubim and seraphim? No. Are they part of the unnumbered throng from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people? No, because the elder is asking about that group. Now somebody might say, well Pastor Borg, maybe the 24 elders is a different way of describing the 144,000. Now the 144,000 are those who will be alive when Jesus comes. Notice that that's not possible. Revelation 14 and verse 3. Revelation 14 and verse 3. Speaking about the 144,000, it says they sang as it were a new song before the throne, before the, living cre the four living creatures, and what? The elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. Question, are the 144,000 distinguished from the 24 elders in this verse? Absolutely, because we're told that they sang a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures, and before the elders. So the 144,000 are not the 24 elders. Now let's ask the question, are the 24 elders those who resurrect in the special resurrection immediately before the second coming of Jesus Christ? Now you know that there's going to be a special resurrection according to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. Also Revelation 1 verse 7 tells us that those who pierce Jesus will resurrect. And there will be a group of righteous people according to Revelation 14 verse 13. Those who died once the message of the third angel began to be proclaimed that are going to resurrect shortly before the arrival of Jesus at his second coming. So the question is, could the 24 elders perhaps be those who are going to resurrect in that special resurrection shortly or immediately before the second coming of Christ. Can't be. Notice Daniel chapter 12 and verse uh, 1 and also verse 2. It says, at that time Michael shall stand up. Of course Michael is a name for Christ, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time, and at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Now is this talking about the end time of trouble? Yes it is. Is it talking about the deliverance of God's people from being annihilated on planet earth? Absolutely. It's something that is going to happen in the future shortly before the second coming of Christ. And then notice what we find in verse 2, and many of those 
who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now my question is, could these people who are going to resurrect in this special resurrection perhaps be the 24 elders? They can't be. And you say, why can't they be? Very simple. According to what we've studied, when Jesus arrived in heaven, the 24 elders were already there. So they cannot be those who resurrect shortly before the second coming of Jesus if they were already in heaven when Jesus ascended and went to the holy place. Are you understanding my point? So they cannot be those who resurrect in the special resurrection that is spoken of in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. Somebody might say, well maybe it's another symbol to refer to those who will come forth in the general resurrection when Jesus is above the earth at His second coming. Perhaps they are those who are alive and remain when Jesus comes. Well, let's read about that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 in verses 15 to 17. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 15 through 17. The Apostle Paul says there, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So my question is, can the 24 elders perhaps be a way of defining or a way of describing those who will resurrect when Jesus comes, or perhaps the living saints when Jesus comes? Absolutely not. And you say, why not? Once again, because when Jesus went to heaven at His ascension, the 24 elders were already present there. According to this passage, the righteous dead will resurrect when Jesus comes, and the righteous living will be transformed when Jesus comes. They were not in heaven when Jesus arrived at His ascension. Are you understanding my point? Now, there's one further group that we need to mention that perhaps could be the 24 elders, and this is the one that is usually identified with the 24 elders. Those who resurrected with Jesus when Jesus ascended to heaven. We've already talked about this group. They're described in the last three pages of the book Desire of Ages. They also described in Matthew 27 and verses 51 to 53. Now my question is, can the 24 elders be this group that resurrected with Christ and went to heaven when Jesus ascended? No. You say, why not? Because once again, the 24 elders were present there before Jesus arrived with, the, with those who resurrected with Him. And so basically, we've disqualified practically every being in the universe that is mentioned in the Bible. Are the 24 elders part of the angelic hosts? No. Are they cherubim and seraphim? No. Are they the living saints when Jesus comes? No. Are they the saints that are resurrected when Jesus comes? No. Are they the ones that resurrect in the special resurrection? No. Are they the ones that went to heaven with Jesus at His ascension? No. I don't know of any other category of human beings or of angels unless the 24 elders are a category of being that is different than any human group or than any angelic group. And we've already identified the 24 elders as those who what? Those who represent the worlds that never sinned. So you see there are two ways of looking at this. One way is to give the characteristics of the 24 elders and say they're the sons of God, the representatives of the worlds that never sinned. That we do by looking at the positive characteristics, but then we, as we've started our study today, we've studied it from the other perspective. By a process of elimination, we have eliminated all of the groups of human beings that are going to be alive and resurrect, and we've also disqualified cherubim and seraphim and the angelic throng. So the 24 elders must be a special group, and that's exactly what we've studied here in the last couple of studies together. Now somebody might say, but Pastor Bohr, how do you explain 
the passage of Revelation chapter 5 and verses 8 through 10. Let's go there for a moment because this passage more than any other has led Adventists to conclude that the 24 elders are human. We've already noticed that Ellen White clearly says that they are not human. Ellen White says that they are the highest of angels, they are strong angels that represent the worlds. Ellen White settles that issue and we also studied it from the perspective of Scripture. But somebody might say, well how do you explain Revelation 5 and verses 8 through 10 then? Well let's take a look at that passage and see what the problem is. It says there in Revelation 5 and verses 8 through 10, And when he had taken the book, this is the one who is sitting on the throne, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Now I want you to notice that there are two groups here that are mentioned, the four living creatures and, who, and whom? And the twenty-four elders, right? Both groups are going to sing this song. That's an important detail. Notice what we find uh, following. It says, once again, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of orders, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Who's singing the song? the elders and the four living creatures, according to the context. Now notice the song. Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and hast redeemed, I'm reading from the King James, hast redeemed what? Us to God, by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign upon the earth. Now do you see where the problem is? It tells us here that the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders are singing a song. And in this song they are singing, you redeemed us. They are singing, uh, you have made us kings and priests, and we are going to reign upon the earth. So you say there's a discrepancy here. Ellen White on one side says that these are strong angels, they're the highest angels, and yet we find here in Revelation 5 verses 8 through 10 that it gives the impression that the 24 elders were redeemed from the earth. Now allow me to say one thing before we take a closer look at this. Who are the four living creatures? We've already studied who they are, right? The four living creatures are what? Seraphim. Now here's my question. Were the seraphim redeemed from the earth? Are the seraphim going to be kings upon the earth? Are they going to reign upon the earth? No, and yet they're singing this song, are they not? So we immediately find a problem with the idea that the 24 elders are human, because not only are the 24 elders singing this song, but the four living creatures representing seraphim are singing this song, and the seraphim were not redeemed from the earth, and they are not going to reign upon the earth. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So immediately we say there must be a different explanation to this problem. Now what is the explanation? Well, let me just share with you something about Bible versions. And I don't want to be misunderstood by what I'm going to say but I'm going to say it anyway because I firmly believe it in the depths of my heart. And uh, right now I'm writing a couple of articles for a Secrets Unsealed newsletter that deals with Bible translations and Bible versions, because there's a lot, of a lot of confusion out there about Bible versions and translations. Allow me to tell you that I personally believe that the King James Version is a very good translation. I believe that the manuscripts that were used to translate the King James Version are very good manuscripts. Actually, the manuscript trail that the King James translation comes from is called the Textus Receptus, and I believe that that manuscript trail is very, very good. I also believe that the King James Version is, is a masterful use of Victorian English. I mean, many people have memorized the text from the King James Version and they can repeat them from memory. 
the King James Version is a great version of the Bible, and yet it is not a perfect version of the Bible. The Textus Receptus is first of all not a perfect manuscript trail, and the King James translation is not a perfect translation. Unfortunately, some people revere the King James Version so much that they almost feel like it was verbally dictated by God. And anybody who amends or makes any changes to the King James translation is accused sometimes of being a Jesuit plant in the church. Now I want to make it clear that I believe that the King James Version is a very good version. It's a good translation. It comes from a good manuscript trail. But the Textus Receptus, in the process of transmission, is not perfect. Neither is the King James Version that was translated from the manuscripts of the Textus Receptus is not perfect either. Now, let me give you an example that sometimes modern versions are better at translation than the King James Version. Let's go as our example to Acts chapter 2 and verses 25 to 27. Acts chapter 2 verses 25 to 27. And I'm a very practical person. Don't anybody take this to mean that, I, that I'm disrespecting the King James Version, I don't like the King James Version, that I think that the King James Version is full of errors and mistakes? No. What I'm saying is that sometimes modern versions translate the manuscripts better than the King James. Notice what we find in Acts 2 verses 25 to 27 in the King James Version. This uh, is how it reads. It's speaking about the resurrection of Christ and His death and His period in the tomb. It says, For David speaketh concerning him, that is concerning Jesus, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. This is Jesus speaking a thousand years before he's born. He's speaking prophetically about his experience of death, burial, and resurrection. Notice verse 27. Here Jesus is speaking and he says, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Is that a problematic verse for Seventh-day Adventists? Uh, very problematic. Because Jesus is saying, you're not going to leave my soul in hell. So the soul of Jesus went to hell, right? That's what people read when they read the King James. But now let me read you the New International Version. And you tell me if it's a better translation. I'm not talking about manuscript trails here. I'm talking about translations. Notice Acts 2, 25 to 27 in the New International Version. I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue uh, rejoices. My body also will live in hope. Because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you allow your Holy One to see decay. Is that a better translation? Much better. So what is the soul? The New, the, the New International Version says, the soul is me. You will not allow me. To what? You will not allow me or abandon me to remain where? In the grave. In other words, it's not hell. The word, the word Hades means grave, according to the New International Version. Is that a less problematic translation than the King James translation? Yes. In fact, the NIV is much better when it comes to the state of the dead generally than is the King James translation. Now, having said that, I just want to say that the King James translation and the New King James translation simply are mistaken in the way that they translated Revelation chapter 5 verses 8 through 10. It's that simple. Now you say, in, in what way did the King James translators make a mistake there in their translation of Revelation chapter 5 and verses 8 through 10? Well, allow me to say this. Every single Bible translation that I consulted, and I'm going to read several of them now, other than the King James and the New King James, translates this passage correctly. It is only the King James and the New King James that does not translate this passage in the proper way. All of the other versions have it right. 
Now allow me to read you from several of these versions. Revelation 5 verses 9 and 10 specifically. I'm going to read now from the New International Version. I'm going to read from several of them so that you can see that, that I, I'm telling you the truth. New International Version, Revelation 5, 9 and 10. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain. Now listen carefully. And with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Is that a different translation? You better believe it. It makes all of the difference in the world. Because what it's telling us is that the 24 elders and the four living creatures are singing about the redeemed. They are not the redeemed. Now allow me to read you on several other Bible versions. The New American Standard Version reads this way. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain, and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. How about the Revised Standard Version? It reads this way, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy art thou, art thou to take the scroll and to open its seals, for thou wast slain, and by thy blood didst ransom men for God from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and hast made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign upon the earth. The New English Bible reads it this way, And they were singing a new song, Thou art worthy to take the scroll and to break its seals, for thou wast slain, and by thy blood didst purchase for men, for God, men of every tribe and language and people and nation. Thou hast made them a royal house to serve our God as priests, and they shall reign upon the earth. Here's the Weymouth translation. And you might be getting tired of me reading translations, but I want to make a point here that the only versions that translate this incorrectly are the King James and the New King James. All of the rest of the Bibles have it correct. Notice what Weymouth says. And now they sing a new song saying, Worthy art thou to take the book and break its seals, because thou hast been slain, and hast purchased for God with thine own blood men out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and hast formed them into a kingdom to be priests to our God, and they shall reign over the earth. Here's the Phillips translation. They sang a new song, and these are the words they sang. Worthy art thou to take the book and break its seals, for thou hast been slain, and by thy blood hast purchased for God men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Thou hast made them a kingdom of priests for our God, and they shall reign as kings upon the earth. Even the Jerusalem Bible, a Roman Catholic Bible, reads this way. They sang a new hymn. You are worthy to take the scroll and break the seals of it, because you were sacrificed, and with your blood you bought men for God of every race, language, people, and nation, and made them a line of kings and priests to serve our God and to rule the world. The New American Bible, also a Roman Catholic Bible, reads this way. This is the new hymn they sang. Worthy are you to receive the scroll and break open its seals, for you were slain. With your blood you purchased for God men of every race and tongue and every people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they shall reign upon the earth. Let me just read you one more. The Jewish New Testament reads this way. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals, because you were slaughtered. At the cost of blood you ransomed for God persons from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You made them into a kingdom for God to rule, kohanim, that means priests, to serve Him, and they will rule upon the earth. Are you catching the point? How do we solve the problem of Revelation chapter 5 verses 9 and 10? 
we solve the problem by realizing that in the King James and the New King James there is a mistranslation. Was Ellen White right then in identifying the 24 elders not as human but as angelic? She most certainly was correct. Now if you believe that the King James translation is the correct translation, then you have a discrepancy between the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. But if you believe that the King James simply mistranslates these verses, then there is perfect harmony between Scripture and the writings of Ellen White. Now, why is it that the elders cannot be human? Let me give you four reasons. Number one, the elders were already present in heaven when Jesus arrived with those who resurrected. So they cannot be those individuals who resurrected with Christ because the 24 elders were there when the throne room was prepared for Jesus to arrive with those who resurrected with Him. Second, the 24 elders cannot be human because the elders and the four living creatures are singing this song. And the four living creatures are seraphim. They weren't redeemed from the earth. They're not going to reign upon the earth. So if they're singing this song, this song cannot be about their experience, they're singing about the experience of the redeemed. In the third place, we notice very clearly in Revelation chapter 7 that the elder is actually distinguished from the great multitude that no one can number from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And so how can you say that the elders are those from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, like it says there in the passage that we just read in Revelation chapter 5, if clearly in chapter 7 the elder is distinguished from those who come from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Finally, Ellen White explicitly says that the 24 elders are strong angels or are the highest of angels they are the sons of God, the representatives of the worlds that never sinned. They are in a special category. They are not part of the angelic hosts. They are not part of the cherubim and seraphim. They are not part of any human group. They are in a category all by itself. They are the representatives of the worlds that never sinned. Now we need to transition into talking about the 24 elders in the rest of the book of Revelation. You see, we've only noticed the 24 elders in Revelation chapter 4 and 5, but the 24 elders are mentioned in several other chapters. Let me just mention which chapters. They are mentioned in Revelation chapter 7, they are mentioned in Revelation chapter 11, they are mentioned in Revelation chapter 14, and they are mentioned once again in Revelation chapter 19, and verses 1 and 2. Now let's take a look at all of these different passages where the 24 elders are mentioned so that we can see at what point in time they are found depending on the chapter where they are mentioned. Now in Revelation chapter 4, just reviewing a little bit, present there in the heavenly throne room are God the Father on His throne. You remember that? God the Father is sitting on His throne. The 24 elders are on thrones around the throne. The four living creatures are in the midst of the throne. And the seven spirits are before the throne. Those are the beings that are present in Revelation chapter 4. Now in Revelation chapter 4 there are two entities missing. Number one, Christ is not mentioned in chapter 4. And in the second place the angelic hosts are not there either. Now when you get to chapter 5, you find the same beings that we have in chapter 4, but you have the addition of the great multitude of angels, 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands that are there in the throne room in chapter 5, and then Jesus is also there presenting Himself as the Lamb as though He had been slain. Clearly, when you read Revelation 4 and 5 from this perspective, in Revelation 4, the throne room is being prepared. In Revelation chapter 5, the war hero, Jesus Christ, arrives with the heavenly hosts into the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And notably, in chapter 5, we're told that the seven spirits are sent to the earth. Interesting that when Jesus arrives and He presents Himself as the Lamb, as though He had been slain, immediately He sends the seven spirits to the earth. What event is being described there? 
it has to be the outpouring of the Holy Spirit when? On the day of Pentecost when Jesus arrived and he was inaugurated in heaven. Now in Revelation chapter 11 once again you have several of the same beings that you have in Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5. But in Revelation chapter 11 you, you don't have all of them. You have uh, God sitting on the throne and you have the Lamb and you have a multitude of angels that are singing. Not all of the individuals that are in Revelation 4 and 5 are mentioned there. However, in Revelation chapter 11 there is no mention of a great multitude of redeemed people. And the reason is that in Revelation 11 verses 15 and 16 what is being described is the close of probation. In other words, it's the moment when Jesus stands up as Michael, he closes the door of probation right before the time of trouble begins. And then of course after the time of trouble Jesus returns with the angels in power and glory to take his people to heaven. So Revelation 11, God's people are not in heaven yet, they're not gathered in heaven yet. That's the reason why in Revelation chapter 11 there is no mention of the great multitude which no one can number from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. But now listen to what I'm going to say. The interesting thing is that in Revelation chapter 14 and in Revelation chapter 7 and in Revelation chapter 19 there is another group added to the groups that were there in Revelation 4 and 5 and Revelation 11. Now what is the group that is added in Revelation chapter 14 and Revelation 7 as well and Revelation chapter 19. First of all let's deal with Revelation chapter 7. If you read verses 9 to 14 of chapter 7 you're going to discover that every single one of the beings that was present there in Revelation 4 and 5 is mentioned again. There's a throne, there's one sitting on the throne who is the Father, there's the Lamb, there's the 24 elders, there's the four living creatures, all of them are mentioned but there's an additional group there in Revelation chapter 7. The additional group is a great multitude of redeemed people from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people that are singing a song of praise to God and to the Lamb. Who has joined this celebration at this point? The redeemed have joined the celebration at this point. Because if you read Revelation chapter 7 verses 9 through 14, that's talking about what happens after the second coming of Jesus when Jesus takes his people to heaven and his people, the great multitude from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people are gathered to there before the throne worshiping and praising Jesus Christ. Revelation 14, you have the same idea. The same beings are mentioned again. There's a throne, there's a lamb, there's the 24 elders, there's the four living creatures that are mentioned, but now there's an additional group that are standing before the throne and they're singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Who are those? The 144,000 who re were redeemed from the earth. What are they doing there? Well the fact is that in Revelation chapter 14 the redeemed have joined the celebration in heaven because this is after the great tribulation, this is after the second coming of Christ. Then when you get to Revelation chapter 19 verses 1 through 9, once again, you have the same beings that were there in Revelation chapter 4 and 5. You have the throne, the Father sitting on the throne, you have the Lamb, you have the four living creatures, you have the 24 elders, you have everyone who was present there in Revelation chapter 4 and 5. But once again, you have a great multitude which no one can number from every nation that are rendering God honor and praise and glory because He has redeemed them from the earth. So what am I saying? I'm saying that in the book of Revelation there is a progression. In Revelation chapter 4 God is sitting there, God the Father, the four living creatures are there, the 24 elders are there, the representatives of the worlds that never sinned, and present there is the Holy Spirit. Chapter 5, Jesus and the angelic throng join the, join the celebration. The redeemed are not there yet. Because in Revelation 4 and 5 we're dealing with the ascension of Jesus Christ to heaven. Revelation 11, the great multitude from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people are not there because Revelation 11, 15, and 16 is speaking about the close of probation at the seventh trumpet and the redeemed have not gone to heaven yet. 
but in Revelation chapter 14 you have the same beings mentioned as in chapter 4 and 5, but now you have the 144,000, the living saints that are alive when Jesus comes. They are present there praising the Lord on the heavenly Mount Zion. What has happened? What has happened, folks, is that now the living saints have joined the celebration in heaven. And then in Revelation chapter 19, this great multitude from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people are once again singing the song of their redemption and they're actually praising the Lord because He has judged the great harlot who wanted to shed their blood on the earth. So in other words, the 24 elders, folks, are present there in every one of these scenes. They are present there when Jesus is about to ascend. They are present there when Jesus arrives. They are present there when probation closes. And they will be present there when the redeemed return to heaven with Jesus, both the living saints and those who died in Christ. Now allow me to say this as we draw this to a close. Jesus gave a parable that illustrates very clearly what we've been talking about this evening. Jesus told the story of the lost sheep. Now usually when we talk about the story of the lost sheep, we apply it to when a church member leaves the church and goes astray, as church members we're supposed to go and we're supposed to rescue that sheep from the church that went astray. Now that parable certainly has that application. But the parable actually has a much broader application than just rescuing church members who have left church. It has a cosmic perspective. Notice Luke chapter 15 and verses 4 through 7. Luke chapter 15 and verses 4 through 7. Here Jesus tells this interesting parable which is contained also in the Gospel of Matthew. Here Jesus says, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And now notice this, and when he what? And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. Beautiful parable. Now what is the cosmic or broader perspective of this parable? Actually, the 99 sheep that are safe and sound in the fold represent the worlds that never sinned. The one sheep that went astray from the fold represents this little planet, planet Earth, in the midst of the universe of God. The act of the shepherd going after the sheep that was lost and leaving the others safe and sound represents Jesus leaving the safety of heaven to come to this world to give His life to rescue the one sheep, the one world that was lost. And the joy of the shepherd when he finds the sheep and places it upon his shoulders and brings it home represents Jesus when He returns the second time and then goes back to heaven, He will have rescued this little world and He will have put it on His shoulders. And when He gets to heaven, He is going to call, so to speak, neighbors and friends to come and celebrate the rescue of the one world that was lost in the midst of the universe of God. I want to read the inspired commentary on this. Christ's Object Lessons, pages 190 and 191. By the lost sheep, Christ represents not only the individual sinner, but the one world that has apostatized and has been ruined by sin. This world is but an atom 
in the vast dominions over which God presides. Yet this little fallen world, the one lost sheep, is more precious in his sight than are the ninety and nine that went not astray from the fold. Christ, the loved commander in the heavenly courts, stooped from his high estate, laid aside the glory that he had with the Father in order to save one lost world. For this he left the sinless worlds on high, the ninety and nine that loved him, and came to this earth to be wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. God gave Himself, now listen carefully, in His Son that He might have the joy of receiving back the sheep that was lost. Isn't that a marvelous interpretation of that parable? Now you say, what does this have to do with the 24 elders? Do you know that what took place in Revelation 4 and 5 is going to be repeated again on a larger scale? You see, what happened in Revelation chapter 4 and 5 is, uh, primarily chapter 4 first, is that all of heaven has prepared to receive the war hero who is returning from the battlefield. Present there is God the Father on His throne. Present there are cherubim and seraphim. Present there are the representatives of the worlds that never sinned. Present there is the Holy Spirit. They're all there waiting to welcome the war hero back from where he has rescued this one lost world. In chapter 5, the angelic throng enters through the gates into the city, and they come with Jesus into the presence of all of those who are waiting in the heavenly throne room. And as we noticed, they're singing and they're praising the Lord. And Jesus raises his hands and he says, Silence! And he goes in before his Father because he wants to make sure that his sacrifice has been sufficient to bring all of his people home someday. Father gives him a hug and the father says, yes, it's enough. And then the father gives the order. He says, let all the angels, let all of the heavenly beings worship him. And now there's an explosion of praise in heaven in honor of the lamb and the one who is sitting on the throne. But do you know that very soon there's going to be another party even greater than this one? And you say, how could it be any greater? Yes, once again, Jesus is going to leave heaven, according to the Bible, with all of his holy angels. Are you listening to what I'm saying? He's not going to come just with a little small group of angels. It says in the Gospels that Jesus is going to leave heaven and he's going to come with all of his holy angels. And in heaven, the Father will be sitting on his throne. And you say, you mean gee, the Father isn't coming at the second coming? No, he's not. If you read the New Testament carefully, you'll find that we're told, for example, in Acts chapter 3 and verse 20, that the Father shall send forth Jesus. In other words, the Father's not coming with Jesus. Jesus is coming with all of the holy angels. The Father will be sitting on His throne. In the midst of the throne will be the cherubim and the seraphim. Surrounding the throne will be the 24 elders, which are the representatives of the worlds that never sinned. The Holy Spirit will be there because His work on earth has been finished. He's wooed sinners to accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And so Jesus will leave heaven. Once again, the two groups that were not there in Revelation 4 will not be there again because Jesus and His holy angels will be coming to planet earth to pick up all of the rest of the redeemed. Do you remember that Jesus presented before the throne of the Father those who resurrected with Him? Do you know that that group was simply a down payment? It was a guarantee that someday Jesus was going to return to heaven with all of His saints, those who died in Christ and those who are alive and remain. And so Jesus will come down to heaven and as He is above the earth, he will say, Awake, ye who sleep in the dust of the earth. Suddenly all of the graves of the righteous will move and God's people will come forth. Those who died in Christ will come forth. The living will be transformed and changed. And then Jesus and all of the angels, and this time not a group of the redeemed, but all of the redeemed, will begin 
their journey to heaven where the heavenly throne room is waiting for the reception. The Father is there. The representatives of the worlds are there. The cherubim and the seraphim are there. The Spirit says come, according to Revelation chapter 22. He must be there if He says come. And now Jesus will return to heaven with all of His holy angels like He did upon His ascension. But this time He's not taking a sampling of His people. This time He's bringing people from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people from every age of the history of the world, bringing them back home. That which was lost has been found. And then Psalm 24 will be sung again. Open up ye gates, and the King of glory will come in. And the sentinel angels who are waiting at the gates of the city will say, And who is this King of glory? And the answer will come, The Lord of hosts, He is the King of glory. Once again, the gates of the holy city will open wide, and God's people, along with Jesus, and, and the holy angels will sweep through the gates into the city. Blessed are those who keep His commandments that they might have a right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. And then Jesus will take his people into that huge heavenly throne room and you say, how are they all going to fit? Well, let me tell you that the heavenly sanctuary is much larger than the one here. The sanctuary on earth was only a little scale model. God did not show Moses the heavenly sanctuary on the mount, he showed him a scale model of the heavenly sanctuary. What that scale is, we don't know. But we do know that 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of angels fit in it. And so God's people will enter into the heavenly throne room. And then you will have that marvelous song that is mentioned in Revelation 5 and verses 12 and 13. Do you know this song actually was sung when Jesus ascended, but it is going to be sung again. The whole universe is going to sing this song when God's people arrive with Jesus and the angels in heaven. It says there in verse 12, let's read verse 11 for the context. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then notice verse 13. And every creature, notice this is every creature now, every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. What do you think? Fantastic. We are going to meet the representatives from all of the worlds that never sinned. In fact, they're probably going to invite us to be guest speakers at their worlds, <laughs> to tell the story of redemption. They're, they're, going to, they're going to say, hey, could you put me on your calendar to come and speak in my world? And I'm going to say, give me a break. I took lots of appointments while I was on planet Earth. Let me rest a little. No, that's not what I'm going to say, because we're going to be in the flower of youth, in the fullness of strength. And we'll be able to travel to other worlds. We'll be able to meet the representatives of those worlds, the inhabitants of those worlds who have been faithful to God and have kept His commandments. But folks, in order to get there, we must have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We can't let anything in this world stand in the way between us and Jesus. You know, Christians are so attached to their stuff, to their things. You know, some Christians have so much stuff and so many things that God couldn't take them out of the world with the most powerful crane in the universe because they're weighed down. Let's not get attached to the things that perish, the things that are vanishing away. 
let's keep our focus on heaven. You know, somebody once said to me, oh, you know, you're so heavenly minded, uh, you're no earthly good. And so I looked at him and I said, yeah, and you're so earthly minded, you're no heavenly good. You know, because the opposite is also true. You know, we're in this world, folks, to reach souls for Christ, to prepare for the coming of Jesus, so that we can be there for this glorious celebration when Jesus comes in power and glory. What a wonderful, magnificent day that will be. Amen. Now the question comes up, and we'll conclude with this, and we'll introduce what we're going to speak about in our last topic in this series. What is the role of the 24 elders? What is their function in the universe? How does God employ them in the administration of the universe? Is there a comparable model on earth that would help us understand the way in which the 24 elders are used by God to administrate and operate the universe? I believe that there is a model on earth. And do you know what they're called? Elders. The elders of the church are actually the model of how the elders operate in the heavenly economy. Do you remember the Jerusalem Council? I'll just get ahead of myself a little bit. Remember the Jerusalem Council? They were making a decision that affected the church everywhere. The Bible tells us the elders from all of the churches came together to deliberate and decide exactly what needed to be done with the issue of circumcision. In other words, the elders were the representatives of all of the churches on earth. And the elders are God's representatives from the worlds in heaven that gather in heavenly council to help the Lord in the administration of the universe. You say, well, God can do everything himself. Yes, but God is a God who delegates responsibility. He cares what people think, and he wants to involve his people in the administration of the universe. What a wonderful God we have. So don't miss the last subject in this series. Hi, C.A. Murray with some additional good and exciting news for those of you who have been praying for this ministry. Beginning in the month of November, Vision TV in Great Britain will carry the signal for Secrets Unsealed and some TV. And it will be on every smart TV in the United Kingdom. This is exciting news because that means 15 million potential families can receive the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you want to get in on the fun and see what they're seeing, you can go to the App Store for your iOS devices and download the app. For the Android devices, you go to Google Play and you can download the app and see exactly what our brothers and sisters across Great Britain are viewing and you can pray with and for them. We're excited about this. And should you like to support this initiative, this move of God, send your tax deductible love gifts to Secrets Unsealed in Some TV and God will bless. In fact, God is blessing as we share the good news of Jesus Christ to our brothers and sisters all across Great Britain and the United Kingdom.
Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, once again we come into your presence with humble hearts, with the spirit of learners, wanting to hear your voice speaking to us. Our thoughts can never reach the height of your thoughts. And therefore, we implore divine wisdom. We ask, Lord, that you will give us tender hearts to receive the message that you have for us today. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. In our topic today, we're going to study about the number of the beast. And I'd like to begin by reading a text that we find in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1. This is the passage that begins the description of the sea beast, which we have already identified as the Roman Catholic papacy, not individuals within the system. We're talking about a system. We're talking about an organization. And we've already clearly identified from the Bible that this beast that rises from the sea represents the Roman Catholic papacy. It says there in Revelation 13 verse 1, speaking about this beast, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. So as we begin our study, we want to notice that the name of the beast is a blasphemous name. And the blasphemous name is found on the beast's heads. Now, in order to understand what this blasphemous name is, we must first of all understand the biblical definition of blasphemy. Do we have a clear definition of the Bible in the Bible of what blasphemy is? consists of? The answer this, to this question is absolutely yes. In the Bible, blasphemy is when a mere man claims to be God, and when a mere man claims to have the power to perform the works of God. And we're going to take a look at several instances in Scripture where blasphemy is described in this manner. Once again, blasphemy in the Bible means a man, a mere man who claims to be God, and secondly, that mere man claims to be able to perform the works of God and exercise in his actions the power of God. One time, Jesus said something very controversial. It's found in John chapter 10 and verse 30. This is what he said to the Jews that were listening to him. I and my Father are one. And we're told in the context that the Jews immediately picked up stones to cast at Jesus. Because you see, Leviticus 24, verse 16, clearly said, and they knew this, that whoever claimed to be one with the Father, in the sense that Jesus was saying it, was claiming to be God. And the Levitical law said that whoever claimed to be God needed to be stoned. And so when they picked up stones, Jesus asked them a question. He said, why do you want to stone me? What evil work have I done that justifies you stoning me? And notice what their response was in John chapter 10 and verse 33. John 10 verse 33. For a good work we do not stone you, but for what? But for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God. What is blasphemy? It's when a mere man claims to be what? God. Now, Jesus was God. He had a right to claim to be God. But according to them, blasphemy is when a mere man claims to be God. Also, blasphemy is when someone claims to be able to perform the works of God. Immediately after uh, Jesus said, I and my Father are one, Jesus claimed also to perform the works of his Father. Notice John chapter 10 and verses 36 to 39. John 10, 36 to 39. 
Jesus says, Do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, You are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and believe that the Father is in me, and I in him. Therefore they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. So notice, the, the definition that Scripture gives of blasphemy is when a mere man claims to be God, and claims to perform the works of God, or manifest in his actions the power of God. Now it's interesting to notice also that the Jews accused Jesus of blasphemy because he claimed to be the Son of God. Now all of the Jews believed that they were sons of God in a general sense of the word. But they knew that when Jesus was saying that he was the Son of God, what he was meaning is that he was the representative of God on earth. That he was the authorized spokesman for God. If you please, Jesus was claiming to be the vicar of God, or vicarius Dei, the representative of God on earth. Now it's interesting to notice also that blasphemy is defi defined in Scripture as when a mere man claims to have the power to forgive sins. Not only when a mere man claims to be God, but also when he claims to exercise the power and prerogatives of God. Notice Mark chapter 2 and verse 7. Jesus meets a paralytic, and he says to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven. By the way, this took place in the city of Capernaum. And the Jews immediately, when Jesus said, your sins are forgiven, they thought in their hearts, according to Mark 2 verse 7, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? You see, they were thinking, if this man forgives sins, and only God can forgive sins, this man is claiming to be God. So blasphemy is when a man claims to be God and claims to be able to perform the functions and the prerogatives of God. Notice 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 3 and 4. This is another passage that is speaking about the Antichrist. By the way, the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians 2 is the same as the beast from the sea, is the same as the little horn, is the same of the, as the abomination of desolation, and the same as the harlot of Revelation chapter 17. In other words, these are different symbols that point to the same power. The man of sin is the same as the little horn, the same as the beast. Notice 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 and 4, what the Antichrist does. It says there, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, which is the coming of Christ, that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. A better translation is the apostasy. In Greek it says apostasia. So it be translated, it should be translated, that day will not come until the apostasy comes first. And the man of sin is revealed. So is this a mere man that is revealed? Yes, it's a mere man, right? The man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. What is one of the main characteristics of the Antichrist? He sits in the temple of God, and he claims to be what? He claims to be God. And by the way, what is the temple of God? The temple of God is not the Jewish temple, which supposedly is going to be rebuilt in the Middle East. The temple of God, according to every other passage in the writings of the Apostle Paul, represents the Christian church. Now, I want you to notice also that this Antichrist of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 not only claims to be God, but he also claims to have the power of God to exercise the power of God. Notice in the same passage, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 9. Speaking about this same individual who sits in the temple of God, showing himself to be God, 
It says there, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all what? Power, signs, and lying wonders. Let me ask you, is this Antichrist only going to claim to be God, or is he going to apparently do the works, the powerful works of God? Evidently he's also performing the works of God, although he is a mere man. He's the man of sin. By the way, the only other time in the New Testament where th these three words appear together in one verse, power, signs, and wonders, is in Acts chapter 2 and verse 22. I want to read that verse because I'm going to show you that what the Antichrist is going to do is falsify the works that Jesus performed while he was on this earth. Notice Acts 2 and verse 22. Men of Israel, this is Peter speaking, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Did Jesus perform the power and the acts of God? He most certainly did. Is the Antichrist going to perform works that appear to be the works of God? Absolutely, because he claims to be what? God. But these aren't the only passages that describe blasphemy. You remember that little horn of Daniel chapter 7. We read verse 25. And one of the characteristics of the little horn is that this horn speaks pompous words against the Most High. Daniel 7 verse 25, he speaks pompous words against the Most High. The question is, what are those pompous words that this uh, little horn speaks? Revelation 13 verse 5 de defines what those words are. It says in Revelation 13 verse 5 that the beast that comes from the sea was given a mouth that speaks great things and what? Great things and blasphemies. So what does the little horn speak? He speaks blasphemies. What does the beast speak? Blasphemies. Must that mean then that the little horn and the beast claim to have God on earth and claim to have the power to forgive sins and also perform many of God's other functions? Absolutely. But this isn't all. In Daniel chapter 8, we have something very, very interesting. And by the way, before we go to Daniel 8, let me just mention that in Daniel 7, this little horn also thinks that he can perform the works of God. Because it says that the little horn not only speaks blasphemies against God, but he actually thinks that he has power to change God's times and God's what? And God's holy law. In other words, he's not only claiming to be God, he's claiming to exercise the functions and the power of God. Then, of course, we have Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8 speaks also about a little horn. This little horn represents the same as the little horn of Daniel chapter 7. But the interesting thing is that in Daniel chapter 8, this little horn is not mentioned as speaking blasphemies against God. You know what the little horn does in Daniel chapter 8? This is extremely interesting. What the little horn does is he tries to supplant the prince of the host. Do you know who the prince of the host is? The prince of the host is Jesus Christ. You can read, for example, Joshua chapter 5 and verses 13 through 15 where the same expression, prince of the host, is used. And you're going to find that the prince of the host is none other than Jesus Christ. And so in Daniel chapter 8 we're told that, that the little horn was going to try and take away the functions of Jesus defined as the daily. Do you know what the daily is? I wish I had time to, to give a whole lecture on the daily. The daily has to do with the functions that the priest performed in the court and in the holy place. The sacrifice in the court was to be offered morning and evening daily. The lamps in the holy place were to burn daily. The bread was to be there daily. And the incense, which represents the prayers of the saints, was to go up daily or continually. In other words, the little horn was going to take away from Jesus these functions, and he was going to appropriate these functions to himself. He was going to think that he could occupy the place of Jesus Christ. Are you understanding what blasphemy is according to Scripture? There's an abundant amount of testimony in the Bible of what constitutes blasphemy. Now the question is, 
does the Roman Catholic papacy claim, or has it claimed in the past, that the Pope is God on earth? Absolutely. Let me just read you a sampling of statements. I could give you more, but we don't have the time to read them all. This is from the prestigious uh, commentary, Roman Catholic commentary, Lucius Ferraris, Prompta Bibliotheca, uh, in the article Papa or, or Pope. Notice what he has to say. The Pope can modify divine law, since his power is not of man, but of God. His power is what? Not of man, but of God. And he acts, now notice this, he acts in the place of God upon earth with the fullest power of binding and loosing his sheep. Notice that this Roman Catholic encyclopedia says that the Pope occupies the place of God. Pope Nicholas I, in, who ruled from 858 to 867 AD, had this to say about the power of the popes. He says, it is evident that the popes can neither be bound nor unbound by any earthly power, nor even by that of the apostle Peter, if he should return upon the earth. Since Constantine the Great has recognized, now listen to this, since Constantine the Great has recognized that the pontiffs held the place of God upon earth, divinity not being able to be judged by any living man. That's blasphemy, folks. It continues saying, we are then, we are then infallible. And whatever may be our acts, we are not accountable for them, but to ourselves. Notice what Pope Leo XIII had to say in an encyclical letter. The name of the encyclical letter was on the chief duties of Christians as citizens. It's dated January 10, 1890. Notice what he said. This is more contemporary. But the supreme teacher in the church is the Roman pontiff. By the way, that's another name for the pope. Union of minds, therefore, requires, together with a perfect accord in one faith, complete submission and obedience to the, of the will to the church and to the Roman pontiff as to God himself. And Leo XIII also said in an encyclical letter dated Jan June 20, 1894, he said unabashedly, we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Time and again, you'll find in the writings of Roman Catholics expressions that apply to the Pope calling him Vicar of Christ, Vice Regent of Christ, Representative of Christ, and yes, Vicar of the Son of God. Do you know the, the Popes have claimed throughout the course of history to perform the functions of God? I don't have time to get into all of this. You have these texts on your sheets, but he claims to have the power to forgive sins. He claims to have the power to set up kings and to remove kings. Daniel 2 says that that's God's prerogatives to place kings and to remove kings. He claims to have the prerogative of, be, of being bowed down to. He accepts the title Holy Father. He believes that he can execute the death penalty upon dissenters. He said that he had power to change the, the Sabbath to Sunday. He's felt that it's okay to change God's prophetic calendar. They claim to be God's supreme judges on earth, and they also claim to be infallible expositors of God's will in faith and morals. Now, folks, all of those things in the Bible are prerogatives of God. If the papacy claims to have had this power, it's because they're usurping the title and they're usurping the power of God. Now, let me read you some blasphemous statements from a book by St. Alphonsus Liguori. Uh, he is one of the few doctors of the Roman Catholic Church. There are very few of those. Thomas Aquinas was another, and there's a handful of other ones. But he did a compendium of all of the Roman Catholic wisdom on what the power of the priest is. And uh, I want to read a statement from his book, uh, Dignity and Duties of the Priest or Selva. This is page 58, page uh, 28. He says this, Were the Redeemer to descend into a church and sit in a confessional, you know what the confessional is, right? And sit in a confessional 
to administer the sacrament of penance. You know what that means? Those who haven't been Roman Catholics, it means that you go to the confessional, you confess your sin, and the priest says, Ego te absolvo. In other words, I forgive you. So, it's, so it says, Were the Redeemer to descend into a church and sit in a confessional to administer the sacrament of penance, and a priest to sit in another confessional, Jesus would say over each penitent, Ego te absolvo, that means I forgive you. The priest would likewise say over each of his penitents, Ego te absolvo, and the penitents of each would be equally absolved. Here's another statement, it gets worse. Listen, when the priest claims to have the power to transform the bread and the wine into the real body and blood of Jesus, notice what St. Alphonsus Ligori says. Thus the priest may in a certain manner be called the creator of his creator. Since by saying the words of consecration he creates, as it were, Jesus in the sacrament by giving him a sacramental existence and produces him as a victim to be offered to the Eternal Father. As in creating the world, it was sufficient for God to have said, let it be made, and it was created. He spoke, and they were made, so it is sufficient for the priest to say, hoc est corpus meum, that is, this is my body, and behold, the bread is no longer bread, but the body of Jesus Christ. The power of the priest, now listen to this, the power of the priest, says Saint Bernardine of Siena, is the power of a, the divine person for the transubstantiation of the bread requires as much power as the creation of the world. That's blasphemy according to scripture. By the way, that's on page, pages 33 and 34 of his book, The Dignity and Duties of the Priest or Selva. Let me read you one more from the same book, page 34. When he ascended into heaven, Jesus Christ left his priests after him to hold on earth his place of mediator between God and men, particularly on the altar. The priest holds the place of the Savior himself, when by saying ego te absolvo, that means I forgive you, he absolves from sin, or he forgives sins. Is that blasphemy according to scripture? That is absolutely blasphemy. And this system claims to have the power of God and claims to be able to exercise the prerogatives of God. Now you notice when we began this evening that it says that the beast has a blasphemous name. And some people have said, well, you know, uh, that's not saying that he had a blasphemous title, it's saying that he had a blasphemous name, so it must be a proper name. Not so. Because in the book of Revelation, name can also refer to a title. And you say, how is that? Go with me to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 16. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 16. This is speaking about Jesus. I just want to show you that the name doesn't have to be a proper name. It doesn't have to, happen, doesn't have to be the name of a specific pope, proper name. It refers to a title. Notice Revelation 19 verse 16. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, notice, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let me ask you, is that a proper name or is that a title? That is a title. So when it says that the beast has a name, the name is not a proper name, it is a title. Now did you notice that the name has a number? You say the name has a number? We didn't read that. Well let's go to Revelation chapter 13 and verse 17. The name is a blasphemous name. Are you, are you clear on that point? The name is a blasphemous name. Now we're going to notice that the name has a number. Revelation 13 and verse 17. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his what? Or the number of his name. So does the, does the blasphemous name of the beast have a number? It most certainly has a number. You say, well, Pastor Bohr, how do you get the number from a name? If this name has a number, which by the way we're going to notice is 666, how do you get a number from a name? Let me explain. In biblical times, they did not have Arabic numerals like we have today. 
The way that they wrote numbers was by using letters of the alphabet. That's true in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, and it's called gematria. That's the method of using n letters of the alphabet as numbers. Let me give you an example. The word for cross in the New Testament is stauros. If you add up the value of the letters in Greek, which, because it's a Greek word, the, the value of the word cross is 777. That's interesting. Now, if you add up the, word, the, the letters, the number value of the letters in the name Jesus, Jesus, the value is 888. And if you add up the letters in Greek, see, we're not cheating, we're not applying, uh, you know, uh, Greek to English or Latin to, to Italian. No, we're using the name in the language and the number system of the language. Uh, the, the word paradosis, which means tradition, the number value is 666. Interestingly enough, the word tradition. Now, how do we find the numerical value of the name of the beast. Well, allow me to read from a few versions here what we need to do in order to determine the number of his name. I want to read from the Living Bible. I don't normally read from paraphrases, but this paraphrase, paraphrase I believe, is very, very faithful to the original text, to the meaning of the original text. Notice what the Living Bible says. On Revelation 13, verse 18, where it speaks about counting the, the name of the beast, and the name has a number. It says, this is the translation, Here is a puzzle that calls for careful thought to solve it. Let those who are able interpret this code, the numerical values of the letters in his name add to 666. Did you catch that? The numerical value of the letters in his name adds up to 666. Notice the way the New English Bible, which is a, a kind of a dynamic translation of the Bible, the New English Bible says, the number represents a man's name. And the numerical value of its letters is 666. Even the Roman Catholic Douay version has a footnote that says this, the, num the numeral letters of his name shall make up this number. So even the Roman Catholic version says what you have to do is find the number value of the letters of his name, and then you know what the number of his name is. Now I want you to notice another characteristic that we find of this, uh, of this beast with this number. Notice uh, Revelation chapter 13 and verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Now, let me tell you something about that expression. It is the number of a man. Really, the word uh, number, uh, the, the word man, has the indefinite article a, but it's not in the original language. It can be translated, it is the number of man. In other words, this is a system that is centered in man. By the way, isn't it interesting that many of these Antichrist passages have the emphasis upon man? For example, the little horn has eyes like a man. This system has the number of a man. And the one who sits in the temple of God is the man of sin. In other words, this is a system that centers on man, that majors on man. It claims the prerogatives of God, but it brings honor and glory to man. Now we want to ask the question, what language should we, we use to determine the value of the letters of the name? You say, well, how do we know which language to use? Should we use the Greek number system to determine the, the meaning of the name? Should we use the uh, Hebrew system, uh, value of the letters? Should we use the Latin system of the value of the letters? How do you know which number system to use to determine the numerical value of the name? Well, the fact is, there's no doubt whatsoever that we need to use the Latin as the language uh, to determine the number and the name of this beast. And you say, why Latin, Pastor Bohr? Well, for a very simple reason. You remember that there was a dragon in Revelation 12 
that tried to kill the child as soon as the child was born. Let me ask you, what empire was ruling at that time? It was Rome. Then you read Revelation 13 and verse 2, it says that the dragon gave his seat and his power and his authority to whom? To the beast. So let me ask you, where does the beast receive his authority from? He receives it from the dragon, and the dragon represents Satan, but also what? Rome. So in other words, the beast, the little horn, received their power from Rome. By the way, the little horn also comes from the head of the dragon beast, which is Rome. In other words, this power, the little horn, or the beast, are, are from what nation? They are Roman powers, which means that we must use the system of what? The system of numbers that was used in Rome. Now let me ask you, what number system was used in Rome? <laughs> the system that is known as Roman numerals. Now, allow me to read a text from the New Testament to prove to you that Latin was spoken in the days of Christ. John chapter 19 and verse 20 tells us that Latin was spoken. Don't you think that I'm just saying, well, you know, uh, they spoke Latin way back then. No, I'm not saying that. The Bible says that Latin was the language of Rome back then. Notice John 19 and verse 20. It says, Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, what else? Greek, and what else? In Latin. So did Latin exist in the times of the Roman Empire? Yes, it was the official language of Rome. Let me ask you, what is the official language of papal Rome? Portuguese? No, the official language of Papal Rome is Latin, which means that his name must be a Latin name because this is a Roman power and we must use Roman numerals to determine the number of his name. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Very, very important. Okay, now let me just digress a moment here because I want to show you that the number 666 is very closely related to Rome. You know, in antiquity, as I was mentioning, in Hebrew, in Greek, and in, in, uh, in Hebrew and in Greek, they used letters to denote numbers. And they did the same thing in Latin, but they changed things around. Whereas in Greek uh, and in um, Hebrew, you know, certain, there were many, many of the letters of the alphabet that were equivalent to numbers. It wasn't so in Latin. In Latin, what they did was choose six Roman numerals to represent all numbers. You say, no, Pastor, there's seven. There's the I, the V, the X, the L, the C, and the D, right? And the M. You say, there's seven, there's not six. But let me tell you that the original system, which was developed by the Latin poets, did not include the M. The M was added in the Middle Ages. The way that they used to write a thousand was not with an M. I, I have pictures of this. They would write two D's side by side to indicate a thousand. And so the Latin po poets established a system where, where there were six letters of the alphabet that were equivalent to numbers. And you know what's very interesting? If you add the six Roman numerals that were part of the original system, if you add 1 plus 5 plus 10 plus 50 plus 100 plus 500, the total of the Roman numerals is 666. This would seem to indicate they were supposed to look for the number 666 somewhere in Rome. Now a question that comes up is what is the name that this system has that this system applies to its leader which is a blasphemous name. I'm going to tell you what the name is. The name is Vicarious Philly Day. Do you know what that expression means? That name means in Latin Vicarious Philly Day. It means Vicar of the Son of God. See in Latin when you have an ending in I, Philly, and Dei, it's the genitive, it's possessive. So basically it means vicar or representative or one who takes the place of the Son of God. Now some people say, well, you know, this is just, this name really is not a name that was given to the popes. It's not an official name of the popes. Uh, it's just Protestants that say that that was a name of the pope. Well, I want to go through some historical evidence to show you that it's not so. 
For example, in the donation of Constantine, I'm going to go through some history now, and uh, you might not know a lot of this history, but I think it's very, very important. In the donation of Constantine, we find the following words written in this document, which I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about in a few moments. As the blessed Peter is seen to have been constituted vicar of the Son of God, blessed Peter was what? Constituted what? Vicar of the Son of God, by the way this was written in Latin, and the expression is vicarius fili Dei, on the earth, so the pontiffs, who are the representatives of that same chief of the apostles, should obtain from us and our empire the power of a supremacy greater than the clemency, clemency of our earthly imperial serenity is seen to have conceded to it. Let me tell you a few things about the donation of Constantine. It was actually purportedly a letter that was written by Constantine the Great, the Emperor, to Pope Sylvester I. And if you read the donation of Constantine, you'll see that Constantine apparently gave temporal power to the Pope. He practically gave the Pope unlimited temporal or political power in the donation of Constantine. Now it's interesting that this document was known as early as the 9th century AD. But beginning with the 11th century AD, it began to be used by the popes in order to prove that they had a right to govern not only in religious affairs, but they had to, uh, the right to govern in political affairs as well, because they used the forgery. They said, Constantine signed this as the emperor, and he told us that we could govern not only in religious affairs, but also in civil affairs. Well, the authenticity of the donation of Constantine was questioned beginning in the 15th century when literary criticism began to grow. Uh, a, a man by the name of Nicholas of Cusa was the first to really say, you know, there's some things in this that show that this doesn't go all the way back to Constantine. This is a forgery from much later. And then a scholar by the name of Laurentius Valla decided that he would do a very meticulous historical study of the donation of Constantine, and he showed beyond any reasonable doubt that this document was a total forgery that was used to try and sustain the temporal claims of the Roman Catholic papacy. By the way, the papacy did not enjoy the work of Laurentius Valla, because in uh, 1559, the Roman Catholic Inquisition put his book on the index of forbidden books. Now some Catholic theologians say, well, you know, this was a forgery. You can't say that because this document used the name Vicarious Philly Day, and it says that this, was given to, this title was given to Peter, and it was given to his successors. You can't say that that's an official title of the Roman Catholic papacy when it's a forgery. But the fact is, folks, that this document, even though it was a forgery, was used at least by ten popes and panned off as authentic and authoritative of the Roman Catholic Church. In other words, even though it was a forgery, they said, this is definitely true. And for hundreds of years, they actually used the wording of the donation of Constantine to defend the temporal power of the Roman Catholic papacy. By the way, this title, Vicarious Philly Day, was incorporated into official Roman Catholic canon law in what is known as Gratian's Decretals, uh, which was published in 1140. And this is an official document of the Roman Catholic Church. It's canon law, it's the laws of the Roman Catholic Church. And that language from the donation of Constantine was incorporated into the Decretals of Gratian, which means that it became official in Roman Catholicism. In other words, it is an official title. By the way, the title is also used by Cardinal Henry Edward Manning in his book, The Temporal Power of the Vicar of Jesus Christ, which he wrote in the year 1862. Uh, actually, at his time, none of the nations of Europe wanted anything to do with the Roman Catholic papacy. And so, uh, Manning wrote his book to scold the nations of Europe because they didn't support the papacy after the French Revolution when the papacy received the deadly wound. And so I'd like to read this statement where he's castigating the nations of Europe for abandoning the papacy. He said this, see this Catholic Church 
this church of God, feeble and weak, rejected even by the very nations called Catholics. There is Catholic France and Catholic Germany and Catholic Italy giving up this exploded figment of the temporal power of the vicar of Jesus Christ. In other words, they're giving up this concept of, of Jesus Christ, the vicar of Jesus Christ. And so, because the church seems weak, and now notice this, and the vicar of the Son of God, by the way that's vicarious, Philly they, the vicar of the Son of God is renewing the passion of his master upon earth, therefore we are scandalized, therefore we turn our faces from him. He's saying we've turned our faces from the vicar of the Son of God, which was the Pope that was ruling in his day. He continues saying in his book, speaking about the growing temporal power of the papacy under the, the uh, popes Gregory the first, Leo the third, Gregory the seventh, and Alexander the third, he says that at this time uh, the power of the pope, the temporal power of the pope became a dogma, a law of conscience, an axiom, axiom of the reason and theological certainty. And then he says this, so that I may say there was never a time when the temporal power of the vicar of the Son of God, there's the same title again, the temporal power of the vicar of the Son of God, though assailed as we see it, was more firmly rooted throughout the whole unity of the Catholic Church and convictions of its members. By the way, the title is also in the prestigious Roman Catholic uh, dictionary or encyclopedia called Prantha Bibliotheca, written or prepared by Lucius Ferraris. I'd like to read you an interesting statement also from the book by John Paul II, Crossing the Threshold of Hope, a very, very popular book. This is what he says uh, on, uh, actually I think it's page 7 of his book, he says this, actually it's page 3. He says, the leader of the Catholic Church is defined by the faith as the vicar of Jesus Christ and is accepted as such by believers. And then John Paul II says this, the Pope is considered the man on earth who represents the Son of God. Is that what a vicar is? Someone who represents someone else? Yes. Who represents the Son of God, and now notice, who what? who takes the place of the second person of the omnipotent God of the Trinity. What is he saying? The Pope what? The Pope occupies the place of Jesus Christ and actually represents Jesus Christ taking his place. By the way, the, one of the greatest patristic scholars, an expert in the writings of the Church Fathers in the Roman Catholic Church was Johannes Quaston. You, even today, you know, if you ask a Roman Catholic who the standard was when it comes to the writings of the Church Fathers, the name of Johannes Quaston will come up. And notice what he had to say. The title Vicarius Christi, that's Vicar of Christ, as well as the title Vicarius Philly Day, is very common as the title of what? As the title of the Pope. Now, for some time, Adventists, uh, we're saying that this title, Vicarius Filidei, was on the papal uh, tiara or on the papal mitre. But people today, they look on, at the mitre and they look at the tiara and they say, uh, the name Vicarius Filidei isn't on there. And so the Roman Catholic Church has said it was never on there. Now I want to share a statement from the Great Controversy, page 61, where Ellen White explains what happened to several of the records that were kept during the period of the Middle Ages. Actually, they were not preserved, they were destroyed. Notice what she says. Rome endeavored also to destroy every record of her cruelty toward dissenters. Papal councils decreed that books and writings containing such records should be committed to the flames. Before the invention of printing, Books were few in number and in a form not favorable for preservation. Therefore, there was little to prevent the Romanists from carrying out their purpose. Now I want to read you a couple of statements from our Sunday visitor, 
It is actually a very important publication. It's the main publication of the Archdiocese of Baltimore, or at least it was. In the edition of November 15, 1914, and by the way, I have copies of both of these that I'm going to read now, so this is something that, that I have in my position, in my files. Uh, the question was asked November 15, 1914, uh, and this is the question. Is it true that the words of the Apocalypse in the 13th chapter, 18th verse, refer to the Pope? Now here's the answer that's given in this Roman Catholic publication. The words referred to are these. Here is wisdom. He that hath understanding, let him count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and the number of him is 666. Now notice this, the title of the Pope in Rome is Vicarious Philly Day. This is an official Roman Catholic, Catholic publication. This is inscribed on his mitre. And if you take the letters of his title, which represent Latin numerals, and add them together, they come to 666. In another edition of our Sunday Visitor, April 18, 1915, another question was asked. Here it is. What are the letters supposed to be in the Pope's crown? And what do they signify, if anything? Here's the answer that's given in this publication. The letters inscribed in the Pope's mitre are these. Vicarius Fili Dei. This is not some Protestant saying this. The letters inscribed in the Pope's mitre are these, Vicarious Philidae, which is the Latin for the vicar of the Son of God. Vicar means he who represents, he who occupies the place, as was defined by John Paul II. Continue saying, Catholics hold that the church, which is a visible society, must have a visible head. Christ, before his ascension into heaven, appointed Saint Peter to act as his representative. Upon the death of Peter, the man who succeeded to the office of Peter as Bishop of Rome was recognized as the head of the church. Hence, to the Bishop of Rome, as the head of the church, was given the title Vicar of Christ. Now the interesting thing is that a Roman Catholic apologist by the name of Patrick Madrid contacted Robert Lockwood, who was the editor of Our Sunday Visitor, and said that he wanted to take a look at the 1915 issue of Our Sunday Visitor. And when he contacted Robert Lockwood, he said, I'm sorry, but that particular issue is not available. It has been expunged from the archives. Now let me tell you folks, if they expunge an incriminating article like that, a whole issue, not an article, but a whole issue of Our Sunday Visitor from the archives, would it just be very possible to delete or take away the title Vicarious Fili Dei from the tiara or from the mitre of the Pope's crown? Absolutely. By the way, there are witnesses from the past who testify that they saw the papal tiara or the mitre with the name Vicarious Fili Dei. Now it's true that September 16, 1917, and this article was repeated on August 3, 1941, of our Sunday Visitor, uh, the Roman Catholic Church disowned what they had said in the first two issues. This is what they said. The words vicarious Philly Day are not the name of the Pope. They do not even constitute his official title. Now we've already noticed historically that it is his official title, and it's officially incorporated and used in the donation of Constantine in Gratian's Decretals. It's also used by Pope John Paul II. It's used by Cardinal Henry Edward Manning. It's used in different sources as an official title. And of course, Johannes Quaston, the renowned a patristic scholar of the Roman Catholic Church says that it is an official title. So let me ask you, which issue of our Sunday Visitor should we believe? Now there are many people these days who uh, choose different names to apply uh, to the number 666. For example, they say uh, Dux Clary, which means the head of the cler clergy, uh, comes out to 666. Another word, Lateinos, which means Latin man, also comes out to 666. Another name, Ludovicus, 
means chief of the court of Rome if you add up the, the uh, letters in Roman numerals it also comes out to 666. Actually the name of John Paul II in Latin Ioannis Paulus II also comes out to 666. And so they try and find the number 666 in all of these names. But let me tell you what the problem that I have with all of these names. None of these names are particularly blasphemous. Is it blasphemous to, to speak of the, he the head of the clergy? No. Is it blasphemous to, to speak of um, the chief of the court of Rome? No. Is the name Ioannis Paulus II particularly blasphemous, his proper name? Absolutely not. Is the, the word Lateinos, which means Latin man, is that particularly blasphemous? No. The name which gives a number must be what kind of a name? It must be a blasphemous name, a name that apparently gives him the right to claim the prerogatives of God and to claim the power of God. By the way, do you know who Jesus left on this earth as his representative when he left? It was not the Pope. It was the Holy Spirit. Notice what we find in John chapter 14, verses 16 through 18. Here Jesus is speaking. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will what? I will come to you. So who did Jesus send as his representative on earth? The Holy Spirit. Now look how, how, how interesting this is. Jesus said, I'm going to be the visible head and I'm going to be in heaven. The Holy Spirit is going to be the invisible head and he's going to be on earth. The Roman Catholic Church has changed that around. And they say the invisible head of the church is in heaven, Jesus Christ, and the visible head of the church is the Pope on earth. In this way, the Pope has usurped not only the position of Jesus Christ, but has usurped the position of the Holy Spirit. If that isn't the epitome of blasphemy, I don't know what is. By the way, did you know that the word antichrist is almost synonymous to the expression biker of the Son of God, vicarius filidei. You say, now wait a minute, Pastor. Antichrist means somebody, somebody who is against Christ or who is opposed to Christ. That's possible. But do you know that the Greek preposition anti also means to take the place of or to substitute for someone. Let me give you some examples. In Greek, the word antibasilius means one who takes the place of the king when the king leaves. You're acquainted with the name Antipas, right? Antipas. Antipas it actually means one who ruled in place of his father. He didn't rule against his father. He ruled in place of his father. We have the word anti-type. Do you know what the word anti-type means? It means that which takes the place of the type. See, when the, when the anti-type comes, you don't need the type anymore because the type is fulfilled. So in other words, anti-type means that which takes the place of the type. So the question is, what is meant then by the word antichrist? The word antichrist does not mean merely against Christ, it means one who seeks to occupy the place of Christ. Just like John Paul II said in his book, The Threshold of Hope. I'd like to finish by reading a statement from the book of Dave Hunt, Global Peace. Now I disagree with Dave Hunt almost on everything that he writes. In fact, I disagree with his identity of the Antichrist here. He says that this Antichrist is going to be a nasty individual who's going to rise in the Middle East when the temple is rebuilt after the church has been raptured to heaven. Now, I don't believe any of that. I believe the Antichrist arose in the Middle Ages, and he ruled for a long period of time. It wasn't one person. It was a succession of individuals. But will oppose Christ while pretend is. And now notice what he says. Of his blasphemous name which is why should be called Father, for what is your...
Hi, I'm C.A. Murray. Have you ever made a promise that you later regretted? Many people have, and the promise is usually broken. The Bible encourages us not to lie and to honor our word. Jephthah, from Judges chapter 11 in the Bible, was a kid from the wrong side. Why not pledge to support the ministry? We're going to look at something which for one, to know you and to fellowship with one. chapter 16, and we'd go directly to Christ by faith and be part of the Christian movement without having to become ceremonially Jewish first. Paul won the day through the Holy Spirit's leading, of course, and the decree was sent out that he should give the gospel without any expectation requirement of mandatory circumcision. So that's what he was coming from, from Jerusalem. Now he's on his way out to tell the good news to all the churches. And we pick up the story again in Acts chapter 16. Then he came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of verse 2 then. He was well spoken of. Out of the five verses here of intro is he was first introduced against the Apostle Paul. And back results seem to be that their job was done with Barnabas and Derby. In spotlight. Oh, and we would see spirit into the work of God in this earth. And what we learn from the spirit of prophecy, a little added detail that's very helpful in Acts chapter 16 is that here in Acts chapter 14, one of those believers who witnessed the persecution of Saul was none other than Timothy. We read this from Acts of the Apostles, page 184. Among those who had been converted at Lystra and who were eyewitnesses of the sufferings of Paul was one who was afterward to become a prominent worker for Christ and who was to share with the who has a heart for the Lord and his service. You, but his father was Greek. It's his sufferings at the close of his first visit. And he longed to share. Okay. This is Timothy. So immediately after the circumcision, the teen back where Timothy first and buddy expected people to be circumcised. He cautioned in many lands and often he would have opportunity to preach Christ, but he opts for another course, even though he had fused everywhere the apostle met. What a fund merely what it would take to get an enforcer by nature. If in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life essence of the character of God, this inherent love suffers long and is kind, its own.